What's up, guys? Uh, I'm excited today. We got a special gentleman in studio, and this gentleman that's going to come in is a man named Eddie Bravo. And he's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu champion. He's a musician. He's a, um, a comedy writer. He um, used to you know, fuck with a lot of hot chicks over by this uh, strip club. He's a, he was a DJ. He um, has like a nice kind of, you know, complexion and everything. He has like an Ecuadorian type of, you know, kind of like a style to his skin. Um, what else? You know, he's, he is a, also people talk about him in the conspiracy space. You know, people think, oh, do you think, you know, sometimes do you think that, um, you know, olives are from, you know, another planet or something like that. People will have crazy ideas about vegetables or Satan or anything. And he has all, you know, he's all, he's in there. You know, this guy's kind of a liaison to the dark arts, if you will. You know, he's definitely out there Voldemort in a little bit or definitely out there, you know, licking on Voldemort's navel a little bit in that space. And I want to tell you, uh, the mad master, Eddie Bravo, when he's the kind of guy you start talking to him and he goes, you know, he's kind of like a puppy. You know, he's like a beautiful conspiracy theorist, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, master musical, um, you know, uh, beautiful artist type of puppy. You know, he's keyed up like that young pup. So you, you know, you break him, you let him out that, you know, you let him out the cage into a, into a, into a, with a question and he just, you know, it'll take you nine minutes to get him back in the car. Uh, and, and, um, but I'm so excited to have him here today and, uh, what else? Oh, this episode is brought to you by RidgeWallet.com. Now Ridge Wallet is a special type of wallet that you, it's, it's in your front pocket. It's in your front carry. You know, some, uh, you know, a lot of animals carry their young in their belly. That's front carry. You don't see an animal that carries its, uh, a that carries its babies in its butt. That'd be insane. And that's just like us with our money. A lot of us these days are carrying our money in our butt. Um, and that's not like somebody, you know, that's not supposed to be gross or anything. That's just somebody with a wallet. But now the new Ridge wallet goes in the front of your pants. That's that front carry. What do you have in your carry, you know? I'm tired of carrying around a bunch of extra stuff in my wallet. So I got some nice accoutrements now, just the basics. No more receipts, no more uh, dirty condoms, you know? No more tickets to Cirque du Soleil that I never used. The freebies and shit. Real stuff only, that's, what, that's what's in my wallet, RSO. And you can go to the Ridge, you can go to RidgeWallet.com slash Theo and you get 10% off. And today we're going to give a, a nice Ridge backpack and Ridge wallet to our guest. And you can get everything you want over there at RidgeWallet.com slash Theo. The link is below. I want to thank Fierce Supply Company for this beautiful shirt right here. And it's a, a clothing company based out of Canada. And we'll put that link below. And they got some beautiful Canadian stuff. So if you're tired of feeling American in your shirt or feeling Japanese or however you feel, then you can get this hit. As well as always, this episode is brought to you by Gray Block Pizza. Um, the owner of Gray Block, my boy Thomas, has a new podcast out called Mod Rats. You can check that out if you want to give that a listen. Um, with all that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome the one and only uh, Mr. Eddie Bravo. I like it, man. Thanks, man. <laughs> when you hear when you hear your music, do you feel like it's like that 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 was a different time in your life? Or you feel like it's just like one of the cards that kind of just you know comes across the table every now and then, or how do you feel about it? Um, I'm making music more than ever now. Really, I, it's always I've always made music. I never. I never stopped. It's right. always been about the music. That's, really? It's just uh, no one wants to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I came to LA. My whole, my, my whole life, I was, um, you know, an aspiring rock star. My really? whole life, since at the age of 10. 
um, my family, all the friends I grew up with down in Orange County, in Santa Ana, they all knew me as a guy trying to make it to music. And when I was in, and when I was 21, I finally made the move. I thought I outgrew the Orange County scene out there. Because you were getting bit? You were getting kind of... No, it's just that I was... I felt like I was... If I really wanted to make it, I had to live right in Hollywood. You yeah. Know? And, you know, at 16 and 17, I'd be driving up to Hollywood on the weekends and partying right on Sunset uh, uh, Sunset. Uh, during the heyday of uh, metal, wow. you know, like in the 80s. Yeah. when. When um, the party was on the streets, you know what I mean? Ev everything was overflowing. The rainbow was overflowing. The Roxy, Gazzari's, which is now the key club, with the whiskey. All those clubs, like in the front, on, on the sidewalk, it was just packed and mobbed with people and dudes and, and sky boo spandex with big ass hair flying the streets. It yeah. was, the party was on the streets. So me and my buddies would drive up. And we would just walk up and down the street looking for girls. You know, we're 16, yeah. 17. We had long hair. We're fully in. You know, we, we were into the, the speed metal scene. We were like into Slayer and Metallica and like the German thrash scene. But girls didn't know that. Girls just saw the long hair. They, saw and they the just look. thought, oh, he's Guns N' Roses. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm Guns N' Roses. Yeah. Whatever. I'm Poison. Whatever, oh, whatever. you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not going to explain to him like the different levels of metal. Yeah. So I was just, I just, I was just on a on Jim Jeffries podcast with Carrie the other day from Slayer. Oh really? Yeah. Holy shit! Were you a Slayer fan? I wasn't a Slayer fan. What kind of music did you like? Um, I grew up listening to like uh, Rodney James Dio, though. Okay. Um, so Dio, I grew up listening to like uh, um, well, did you Guns N' Roses, Metallica. That okay. was it. Aerosmith. All right. Um, James so you were Addiction. a metalhead. You were kind of a metalhead in yeah. the rock. Yeah. Oh, that was the first thing. Yeah. I mean, my brother and I. My brother and I used to fist fight to uh, Slayer songs. He used to put oh, them shit. on, and then we he would beat me up. <laughs> so basically. So seeing Carrie, that was the first thing I told him. I was like, "Hey, man, my brother and I used to fist fight to your music." Yeah, man. Um, the music industry had me hook, line, and sinker, man. I was chasing the mansions and the hoes. Wow. I was the, my whole life was all about getting that mansion, partying like David Lee Roth, having fifty chicks around me. I was chasing that shit. They got me hook. MTV got me. I was watching MTV. I'm like, I want that, that shit, you know. So I eventually like that. Pour some sugar on me, like that kind of those yeah, kind of videos. Yeah, my goal, like my goal was to move to Hollywood. Yeah, and get some strippers to support me in my uh, musical uh, endeavors. You yeah. know what I mean? Have them buy me groceries. Cause I heard the stories from like the Motley Crue stories where they were, they were uh, when they were first blowing up in Hollywood, they'd have all these strippers bringing them groceries. They didn't work. All they did was write music all day. That was the lifestyle that, that I wanted. Right. They got me, man. They brainwashed me. So they that got story, me good. You were hooked. Oh, I was hooked. And by the time I figured out, you know, I thought it was really easy to make it in the music business. Cause at, at 13 maybe at 12 or 13 there was a band called queen's reich you remember mm -hmm, them yeah they had a song called Sil queen, queen of lucidity was yes that them? yes yes that was when they were huge right but in the very beginning they released an ep with the song queen of the reich on it and just one song blew them up so i thought oh shit all you need is one good song and you automatically blow up right Th that's what i really believe yeah. i believe that if you have one good song you will blow up you can make it happen and yeah. so did you and, and so that kind of so you figured that, so as far as you, in your mind at that point, you're like, oh, well, yeah, I can make these other things happen. Yeah. Then I just got to make one good song. Yeah, one good song. And by the time I, I realized that that's not how the music business worked, it was too late. Wow. I dug myself in way too deep. What, with the drugs <laughs> and the partying and the, and the fun? <laughs> well, I wasn't really into drugs. I right. drank. You know, right. I was always... I, I was always drinking. I'm Mexican, and you know that's uh, it's pretty normal for Mexicans. But um, I, I was never into coke, and I didn't smoke weed at the time. Oh, I was wow. totally against weed. Didn't do coke. Didn't do you know heroin or crack or anything like that. Um, every now and then, if I was trying to hook up with the girl and she was like a speed freak and yeah. really, really, common, you have to get a little bit in you. Yeah, you know what? They they bust out the little crystal meth line. I'm like, yeah. fuck. I go, I would do it yeah. if it meant getting pussy. Yeah. Back when I was 16 and 17 and 18, I would oh. do it, and you know, I always regretted it. I, you know, you have 
the energy of you know, 20 men, yeah. you know, and, and it only lasts for like a day and then you, you have to pay for it and then you're going to sleep for like two days straight. Yeah. And it always sucks to come down. Oh, that come down, man. That's I bad. never, never wanted to do it again. I never, yeah. it was never like, damn, I'm, I feel like shit. Give me some more crystal meth. It was, it was like, I will never do that shit ever again. And then like a year later. Some vagina and, would come along. And she, yeah, she's, yeah. she's, an, in, in, yeah. She, you know. Dude, that's the vagina. Look, vagina is a gateway drug. People don't realize that. <laughs> exactly. You know, just like I say, uh, hanging drywall, carpentry is a gateway drug to doing drugs. You yeah. don't meet somebody that does drywall that doesn't also do, uh, you know, uh, speed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't make any sense, but it's never put on that scale you see like oh well weed is a gateway drug dude vagina is a gateway drug and also uh carpentry and hanging drywall every one of my buddies that gets into drywall a is that a year, bit no but every one of them a year later is in aa man yeah, that's you good. know that's good. um so i moved to hollywood at 21 uh and so when now you say you were hook line into it at that point you were hook line into hollywood you wanted I that had dream to, i had to I realized that it was more than one song. Yeah. I didn't really, I didn't realize exactly how the music business worked. I thought it was just going to be really easy. Uh, people would tell me, like my uncle told me, you know, they didn't want me to move to Hollywood. It's only like forty-five minutes in the traffic. <laughs> Jesus, but they thought I was. Well, moving. Mexican families are close, yeah. right? That's not exactly. That far. So they thought I was moving to fucking England or wow. something. Yeah. And my uncle told me, "Goes, do you know, do you realize that it's it's a one in a million shot that you're going to make in the music business." And I thought I was that one in a million. I was wow. a fucking idiot, you know? <laughs> now, so, now, okay, well, at that moment, though, that point, you're an idiot or you're, like, but you have to have some of that, right? Yeah, you gotta you gotta be uh, um, an idiot, you know, if you think yeah. you're just gonna make it in the music business. And I really thought, I really thought it was 100%, I thought it was a matter Damn, of fucking crazy. time. That's so, I thought, it must be nice I am that the confidence. chosen one. Yeah. Oh, it was beyond confidence. I knew for sure. And then every, every um, Christmas or Thanksgiving, I come back and visit my family. And they're like, how's the music, Edgar? How, how's the new demo? You got a new demo. There was always a new demo. I always had a new demo, a new band. It, it, it was like, it was like they, know, they actually saw me live once. I brought my whole family, my aunts, and, and it was horrible. It was like no. the worst slayer you can imagine. Yeah. And, you know, a shitty club in Santa Fe Springs called <laughs> Checks, and we played with Sacred Reich. And, um, oh, Sacred the, Reich. Sacred Reich was signed, and, and uh, you know, it was, it was um, a big gig for us, but we were horrible. Yeah. It was just, and my aunts, there's just Mexican aunts huh? there, and there's all these long hair. El Dia de los Muertos, it's a dark night when it's- Yeah, they knew, they're they, like, damn. They want. They were they, they they were trying to plan an intervention to get me out of music. Like, bad music. Don't wait, they're like, yeah. you're, the, you're, you're very smart, you can go to college, yeah. you can do something with your life, what are you doing? And then they finally just gave up on me, like, fuck it. Yeah. I went to Hollywood. Now, were you ever influenced by like La Bomb or any of that, like that type of stuff? Huh? No, 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 I, no. I, Probably listen to a um, hundred thousand hours of mariachis, oh my God. and I can't tell one song from the next. Really, I don't know one vocal melody or nothing. You would think I would know the fucking songs yeah. and who the, the singers were. Yeah, I was just bombarded with it, but I never retained not even one song. I don't. You know, didn't want that. There was no attraction. To I it. didn't retain. I couldn't tell the difference from one mariachi song to the next. Yeah, you know, it was um, it was something. My mom was so into. My mom wanted to be a singer when she was younger. So anytime we go to a Mexican restaurant, they have a mariachi. My mom's gonna get up and oh, sing wow. with that goddamn mariachi. You know, she. And, That's awesome. Yeah. When now, so as a kid, then did you see her doing that? You think that inspired you at all in a weird way, or no? No, I, maybe subconsciously. But what really inspired me was in 1978, the Kiss movie that was on NBC called Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, mm -hmm. and it was right when. You know, there's like early Kiss, 73, 74, 75, where, you know, everyone's like, yeah, I like early Kiss. But then once they blew up in 76, 77, they got really bubblegummy. And then mm -hmm. all the hardcore fans, you know, they, they kind of died. Like all bands. Yes. You know, like Vanilla Ice was hot for one fucking year. Right. And then he went down. MC Hammer was the hot thing. Then it's embarrassing to say you like MC Hammer. Right. It was getting like that. I got into Kiss when it was embarrassing for teenagers to say they like Kiss, but I was eight. So I didn't know. I didn't well, know what a sellout was. I didn't know. And you weren't even a sellout at that point as an eight-year-old you're still like people are like holy shit this it kid's was like kiss yeah kiss was so um over and dead by the time that tv movie came out mm -hmm. it, but to the hardcore fans that i was eight 
And I didn't know anything about Kiss, but I was talking shit on Kiss at school because the night that movie aired at school, the kids were talking, the eight-year-olds were talking about the Kiss movie. You're going to see the new Kiss movie tonight? And everyone's like, fuck Kiss. (laughs) Eight-year-olds didn't know shit because their older brothers and my stepdad was... uh, a classic rock guy and mm-hmm. he couldn't stand kiss so mm-hmm. to him he was into like led zeppelin and and kiss was just bubblegum bullshit at, yeah. at that point at that point at now that point. The, the stepdad was he cool did he have a mustache what kind of stepdad was he He was a total douchebag he was evil but he did like classic rock got me into van halen uh you know um uh, uh so like ted nugent the pretenders just it goes yeah. on and on he was that's the gifts really, of a step that usually just a little bit of music and some pants or something they yeah. you know <laughs> you know what when he took off he beat my mom and took off he left the stereo oh, and the wow. stereo we couldn't touch his stereo you know when he was when he, you know if he wasn't around we'd play a record on the stereo and it was so yeah. weird because i didn't understand stereo i didn't know there was a left speaker and a right speaker because i had a little turntable with one speaker right so when you don't realize that you're missing half the music and the guitar riffs and shit on, that, that are playing on the other <laughs> side. So whenever I play Kiss records on his stereo when he's at work, the whole other world. I'm like, what the fuck is? What are all these other riffs going yeah. on? I was only hearing one guitar. It was so weird. Wow. I didn't get it. I didn't get what stereo was. And then, <clears throat> so stepdad left some good stuff. You know, he left to treat some music. You're into music. Um, and then when, we when the Kiss movie came out. Uh, we I talk shit on Kiss the whole time. Everybody did in school, but me and my brother, we were really liked it. We, we. It was eight o'clock Friday night, NBC. We fucking turn that thing on. And we're like, oh shit! And our, my mom, my mom was cool because usually at eight o'clock she got the TV. Mm-hmm. She was watching her novelas, like yeah, Sp- yeah, Spanish soap operas. Uh, she was watching Viviana at that time, and mm. she like she she knew how important this was to us. But we were talking shit on Kiss, but there was so much hype, we had to watch this movie. Saw the movie, rock and roll all night, blew my fucking mind, and I just I wanted to be a rock star as soon as I saw that movie, and <clears throat> went to Gemco, which was like a Walmart back mm-hmm. in the day with my aunts. And like, remember, you ever see uh, South Park when Cartman wants to get a toy and he drags his mom and he's the boss and he's looking for yeah, the toy? Yeah, You know what I mean? It was just yeah. like that. I had to get rock and roll all night and party. Year. I had to get that goddamn song. So we went, marched in the Gemco, went to the record department, dragged my aunt, and we were just went through the Kiss records and I found rock and roll all night. And it was on the Kiss Alive album. And uh, um, I didn't know what a live record is. My aunt goes, I think this is a concert record. I'm like, Pfft what shut up it's a record a record's a record so got it home put the the needle on and then the audience you know here it's a live record oh. i thought what the fuck is this a football game right. i didn't get i didn't know what a live <laughs> record was so then you're getting all, so it's interesting man it's like you get these little bitty doses of like the whole musical world you get you know first you um you get one half of you get mono and then you get stereo and that kind of blows your mind fuck and yeah. then you get the audience level it's almost like it came in at doses that were like you know, for a guy that seems like as active-brained as you are, and this is ju- that's some judgment for me, I don't know you, but uh, a guy who seems as active-brained as you are, like, that's almost how you need it in order for it to, like, you know, piece by piece for it to kind of build. Yeah, yeah, it was an inch-by-inch inch type of thing. And, um, and, you know, from that point on, uh, the only other thing, the only other thing I was into was being a football player. I mm. wanted to be, a, I was really into football, and I thought, okay, it's going to be, I'm going to be a rock star and or a football player. And, um, you know, in 1979, I'm nine years old. I'm playing tackle football, junior All-American. I'm playing fucking middle linebacker and defensive end. You know, everyone's the same size. I didn't realize that I was going to stop growing. I didn't realize Mexicans don't play football. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I really thought I was going to be a fucking, I could be a professional football player. Like, a lot of Mexican men and women are the same height. Like, is there a certain, how tall are Mexicans? Is there one height? No. Five, four. Okay. Cause I see some bro, and I also see like I used to see if they if you leave a street light on, dude, Latinos will end up kissing under it. I noticed that. Bro. <laughs> we don't play football, you know. We play soccer football, you know, yeah. but not like American football. Once I realized that, <clears throat> I went in, in, in at sixth grade was the first taste of like maybe because in my neighborhood we're playing street football, and I was a fucking star, right? You know, uh, with other Mexicans, right? <clears throat> but once I went to school, played tackle in the fourth and fifth grade. Uh, and then went to sixth grade. There wasn't tackle in the sixth grade. Right. And it was flag football. So you didn't play. You didn't put the pads back on until high school. So I didn't make it. That's when I in sixth grade. I I was too slow, and I blamed it on the fact that it was flag football. I'm like fuck flag football. Wait till ninth grade when we play tackle football. I'll show you what the fuck's up. <laughs> okay. I won the team ball at junior all American. Shit. 
you know, peewee football. Yeah, yeah. I was a, I was a little star in peewee football, but I, uh, in the sixth grade, you start to separate, you know, um, uh, and then in seventh grade again, I didn't make the goddamn football team. So do you got? Are you realizing you're just not any good at it? I was. Um, Mexicans can't run fast. Really? No, no. We could jump fences like a motherfucker. Right. I could do that. I could climb a tree. But uh, so if the whole track were fences, you guys would cruise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I realized hey, it's not going to happen for me in football. So football was out, and so and then you were all, left just all, with music. It was just music at that point. And I started let my my I let my hair grow. Got really into Slayer and writing satanic lyrics and shit. And I bought you, like a satanic Bible. But were you doing the work Just behind the, the scenes? Lyrics. Because it sounds like you have all the accoutrements. You know what I'm saying? You got the hair. You know what's going on. You're tuned in with music. Are you playing any music? Oh, absolutely. But the the first band I put together was called uh, the Bikers. It was we were gonna come out on stage with our BMX bikes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then it then uh, it switched to tight action. And then it switched to execrate, which is to put under a curse. Jesus. And at that point, all my friends- That's the dark my, arts at some point. It sounded like it was evil. violent. It was evil. At 13, I was writing satanic lyrics and shit. And I, I started playing drums only because everybody else in the band, all my friends, they already had guitars and no one, no one had a drum set. So I thought, uh, and, I, and I could air drum to I Love It Loud by Kiss. It was like- doo, 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 doo. So I figured I could play drums. Right. I'm like, oh, I could, pl I could play drums. Um, Damn. Just, I just started playing drums. So I started playing drums just because no one else would. Okay. Um, and then uh, I started taking drum lessons. And my drum teacher, this was changed everything for me. My drum teacher, uh, I show up to his, his house to take a drum lesson. And he had, he had a, a guitar, mm -hmm. an acoustic guitar on his bed. Mm -hmm. And... Um, even though the only reason I played drums was because no one else would, once you start playing drums mm -hmm. or whatever, once you start playing bass, that's the best instrument. You know, the drums are the best. So he had a guitar and I kind of felt like betrayed. Like, why are you fucking playing a guitar, man? I mean, I'm taking lessons from you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're stabbing me in the fucking back. It yeah. was like that. And he said, listen, in the music business, the drummer's always at the mercy of the songwriter of the band. You know, it's not going to be like that for me. I'm going to write. The, the music i'm mm. gonna write the lyrics i'm gonna be one of those drummers and i thought holy shit so am i i don't want to be at the mercy of someone else yeah so at that point i bought a guitar and even though i was playing drums all through the 80s i was writing the music writing the lyrics because of what the, my drum teacher told me brian johnson never forget that guy that was he said that, the drummer is always at the mercy of the of the writer the songwriter the songwriter like, like yeah there's very few bands where the drummer is the lead singer uh, or not even the lead singer, or just who writes the music, right? Who who arranges it, who puts it together, who produces it. It's rarely the, the drummer. The the drummer is just like like a hired gun, generally yeah. the least important guy in the band. Yeah, and uh, that's Rush he, is like that actually. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Neil Peart, he yeah. writes uh, all the lyrics. Yeah, I actually used to play the drums. He was a big inspiration to me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that one drum lesson that changed, changed everything. It. So from that point on, I always wrote. The music, not all of it. I would write with you know the guitar players of the band, uh, like James. Mm -hmm. He was uh, he was one of my. Uh, Do you partners. collaborate well with others? Because you seem like kind of like a. Uh, are you are you are you a guy that you know you like to kind of create it just on your own? Well, it's a good question. Um, this is the way I worked in the bands, the bands I was in. I would I would uh, I didn't want to be a dick, mm -hmm. so I said I would say the rules of the band are. Anybody in the band can write and contribute. Mm -hmm. But if you bring a riff into the band or a little part, if one of the guys in the band doesn't like it, we're going to fucking chop it out. Wow. We can't, we're not going to use it. We're only going to use your shit if everybody in the band likes it. That's pretty fair. Right, it's fair, right? Yeah, it's, it's no, democratic. And <clears throat> people that don't write in the band, they realize, you know, you, we got to get on stage and play this in front of people. So you, you want to fucking force your riff that nobody likes. We're going to be on stage playing it. The audience ain't going to like it either. Right. So real quick, they understand, and everyone knows their role. Like, okay, uh, this guy writes all the cool riffs that the audience likes. So it's better if we play his riffs. Yeah, that's a know? pretty solid formula. And so how did that work with the bands? Did it work pretty well? It worked well? great. It worked great. So the way I would write music was... <clears throat> Anybody who wanted to uh, uh, give me riffs, they gave me a tape. Like yeah. the two guitar, I'd be the drummer, and the two guitar players would give me tapes of all, like 10 riffs, mm -hmm. 15 riffs. Mm -hmm. the, um, and you and check them out? I would check them all out, and I would have like a song, like a skeleton for a song, and then I would take the riffs that I would like, 
and I would stick it in and I would record the whole song on a four track. And so I would have a whole shitty production, but here's the whole song. Let's duplicate that. And the guitar players would listen to it and they'd wait for their riff. Oh shit, there's my riff. Cool. So they'd be happy about it. Oh, that's cool. And they'd be happy that I actually had the skills to arrange it and put it all together. You do the work. Yeah, you're showing yeah. back up with something. People love that. Yeah, so, uh, and they knew that if I really liked something, it was a good riff and then everybody else was going to like it. Nice. So they only, so after a while, they trusted me to yeah. put it all together. So I was always putting together the stuff. And I, I probably wrote half the lyrics and and my uh, my buddy James, he wrote, he was really good at writing lyrics too. So we wrote lyrics together. Sometimes he would write the chorus of the song and I would write the verses of the song and I would just put it together and uh, arrange everything. And the songs were long too back then it was cool to write eight minute songs 10 minute songs like yeah that. metallica oh like, yeah like, some uh, of that were going like forever master of puppets you know eight minute song is not uncommon you know oh no there were some songs i remember um i remember a couple songs that lasted i felt like a third of my childhood you know like there were some songs that were like not you know something you get a song that was 14 minutes on a yeah. on a cassette yeah. tape i got burned burnt out really quick writing uh, uh speed metal stuff it's just like after it's the a same while, thing. after a while, just the drum beat, just you know, I started getting burnt out, and <clears throat> and you can't play it a lot of places, like you yeah, know, you can yeah. play it at like a, and there's no girls at the shows. It's being yeah. like, what the fuck am I doing? Because that music, I was chasing girls. that mansion. I'm yeah. like, speed metal bands don't have mansions, man. Yeah, Slayer don't got they got apartments and <laughs> yeah. shit, you know, and they're broke, yeah. and the, the bass players are sleeping on couches. Well, they, they a lot of them end up without the metal and just on speed. I feel yeah, like too, yeah, like, like exactly. A lot of, it's what a am gateway I doing? drug. Speed metal's a gateway drug. And um, you know, hip hop was was blowing up at the in the '80s too, and I loved. Uh, the concept of rap. I loved. I love that in rock you had to be metaphoric and you had to be poetic and vague and like like what are these songs really about? You had to. But in rap you could be that and funny, super violent. You could be straight out. You there was no limit in rap. Okay. I loved that, but I didn't. I wasn't really into the music. But were you chase like and not chasing? But do you feel like were you aiming to be a star? Do you feel like because I know the first part you said because I wonder sometimes like when I came to Hollywood like or what I wanted to be. You know, I know I wanted to do stand up, and I, I know maybe somewhere in my head I wanted to be, you know, part of. I don't know if I wanted to be part of Hollywood. I guess I, somewhere in my mind I wanted to be popular. You know, like. Because the first part you mentioned about the about the speed metal and stuff or, or the rock is that, you know, about the the mansions and the girls, you know, and wanting that lifestyle. Maybe that's it. Did you feel like you were kind of chasing like a lifestyle a little bit? Yes. Or what was some of oh, your motivation? Oh, man. I... I... Because I, I was just was most, too. I was the most insecure kid. I was a product of my father. My real father didn't give a shit about me. Yeah, he didn't give a fuck. He had nineteen kids. I was one of nineteen Jesus. kids. Jesus, he was just fucking everybody and getting everyone pregnant. So did and, you just run into kids that looked like you sometimes? You'd be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't like that. I looked like my mom. Really? So uh, you know. Oh, so that was kind my of mom. A blessing. My mom had three kids. I was one, of, but. Um, <clears throat> did you feel like kind of blessed that you looked like your mom since your dad had so many kids? Did you ever think about and that? And since kinda? he was so ugly. Right. <laughs> like, thank God I don't look like that motherfucker. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, so with the rap thing, this is this is how the music evolved. Um, I, I liked the concept of rap, but I didn't like musically where the rap was coming from. I, I really wasn't into funk or like James Brown or George Clinton. Wasn't into that shit. Yeah. But then I heard Public Enemy collaborate with anthrax and they did a like a like a speed metal rap song so that was called a crossing Bring the noise once i heard that i mean one dmc was already mixing rock and rap and i kind of dug that but yeah. was, they were mixing more like they were like uh acdc making rap and i wasn't a, at that point i was full-blown like speed metal so i thought that was cool acdc was cool uh, run dmc was cool but then the collaboration between anthrax and public enemy that's what got me and right in the middle of me like not knowing what the fuck i wanted to do it's i'm like do i, do I want to write another speed metal song i thought shit there needs to be a whole band like this like a speed metal rap type band so that's where you went next So that's that was next so that Damn. that was the big move the big move was um i'm going i'm gonna move to fucking hollywood sell my drums i'm already writing the music i'm gonna play guitar and i'm gonna make a, a part rap part metal, part electronic, part gothic, and just mix up a bunch of stuff. Like the Anthrax Public Enemy collaboration didn't have synth, because I was I was getting secretly, I was into getting getting into The Cure and Depeche Mode mm -hmm. and Nine Inch Nails, you know, Damn. first album. So I was really getting into like a gothy, kind of cool um, synthy sound. Mm -hmm. 
and I was doing that secretly because you can't really you're in the Slayer you can't tell people you're in the Cure <laughs> they'll but, fucking kill you you know what I mean so, back in the 80s were you like so what did the other speed metal guys think when you're like you brought a couple brothers into the studio and no, said what, look what, we're, what, we're adding in rap yeah what happened was my guitar player James who's black guy oh okay he was a, he was he was my guitar player in the speed metal project, we formed our speed metal band together. Me and him were the main songwriters. Wow. But on the but then we had a, a, another guitar player and a drum, uh, another guitar player, a bass player, and a singer. So what we did me and James. I said, "Hey, let's let's do a side project. Yeah, we'll do like a hip hop side project, but we'll do it like fucking with not typical hip hop music." Um, we'll make hip hop for people who don't like hip hop, you know, for the alternative. And we did it. We made a demo tape. It was, it was garbage. It was our mm -hmm. first attempt at, it at mixing everything. It was, it was garbage. Yeah. But we liked, I liked moving that way. So I basically produced all the music. And James, the guitar player, he became the rapper. Oh, right. Because it turns out he liked rap, and I didn't know that. Wow. I thought he was a pure, like, metal black dude. So you guys were know. all hiding your true selves yeah, I'm like, a little exactly. bit. Exactly. I'm like, you like fucking uh, <laughs> rap? He's like, yeah. But he felt since he was black and in the metal scene, he had to be a super encyclopedia on metal, because you had to, to be. To be respected. Yeah, because, yeah, like, you know what? There wasn't that many black people in speed metal. Yeah, was I like, think there's just him. There was, like, four. Yeah. You know what I mean? Caton DePena, the singer for Hyrax. He, he was respected because he knew so much about the history of speed metal and hardcore and punk and all that that people are like okay he's cool um, so now so it's like so with music then I mean it seemed like you just kind of as you like something you just take it right into whatever you're then creating yeah I was like. getting really yeah, I was the only reason I got into speed metal is because we we were shitty musicians and so and shitty musicians can play that, can play speed metal yeah do speed metal do punk hide your shit yeah you know what I mean Damn. you know especially you can't do like a serious rock song you need serious vocals and you need professional arrangements you need people who really know what the fuck so a hook did you is. like music or were you good at music I just wanted to be a rock star and and when you suck you play. Uh, shit that you're just disguising yourself. You're disguising your your uh, inability to sing yeah. and play by just screaming and yelling in mics. Yeah, think, but then as I got better at, at my uh, uh, guitar and got better at putting together songs, then we started bringing in like... I, I, I remember getting my first real vocalist, our first lead vocalist, still mm -hmm. in the speed metal band. He actually knew how to sing, like Rob Halford, and he was really good, like Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden. He was really good, so I learned a lot from him. Like shit, the singer we had before was just like a like a punk singer doing thrash. Yeah, it was just a stepson, somebody's yeah, stepson. Like, we were doing harmonies and shit, and yeah. I'm like, fuck, that's cool. You're doing two different keys and, and two different pitches and making them work together. I didn't really notice that shit before. So then I started evolving musically. And um, when we did this little side, that little side rap band, the rest of the band, like you said, they were kind of like, what the fuck are you guys doing? I'm sure. Yeah, like, well, are you guys leaving? We're like, no, 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 this is just a side project. But meanwhile, we're like, let's do this full time. Wow. So we decided to move to Hollywood do forget speed metal so move you to Hollywood. one bad band and to make another bad band yeah yeah but at least this new band that wasn't speed metal and it was a combination of rap it was like the the, the same formula as lincoln park because yeah. if you break down lincoln park yeah. it's part rap part singing uh, a heavy guitar clean guitar acoustic drums and electronic drums too since synthetic drums so they mixed everything keyboards too they had a lot of synth mm -hmm. so that's the same the same formula that's what you're looking for we, no we did that in 91 wow. remember lincoln park's first album came out in 2000 yeah so we were I, that you were, ahead we were of the curve. way way before lincoln park but but anyways but we were doing it wrong because we were still had the eight minute songs but can you imagine lincoln park most of their songs are like three minutes to the point three minutes one second two minutes 53 seconds three minutes 11 seconds to the point a nice short song. We were doing the same formula, but nine minutes. Yeah, that's song. aggravating. Ten minutes. Yeah, it was you're bothering ridiculous. people for this the last six minutes is bothering yeah, exactly, people. exactly, exactly. But Lincoln Park inspires you. It's like it, it gets you pumped up. Does the rap? You're right there. Yeah, get and, to the point. Yes, get to the point. And we didn't because because I dumped all the speed metal and the. Uh, I didn't want to go right into three minute songs. I felt like that was too much of a sellout. Right. I already felt like people, I was a kind of a sellout leaving speed metal because you feel right, that way. Yeah. Like look at him, like there was a lot of a lot of musicians that were in in thriving speed metal bands and they would leave. I remember Larry Lalonde from Possessed. They were the most satanic speed metal band. He When he left the band to form a, like a, um, like a, um, a comical type, Red Hot Chili Peppers type band. I forget the name of the band, Mr. Bungleman. He did something and, 
he, we considered him a sellout. Look at this motherfucker. He left Speed Metal to do like a regular band. Yeah. Fuck that dude. So I felt a little bit of that too. So w that's why I had to keep the songs long, odd to meter. respect it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I it was a slow progression, and then eventually, uh, that band. Um, uh, now I'm in Hollywood trying to sell that band. Um, I'm making. I'm producing all the music. James, my former guitar player, now he's the rapper. Yeah. And now this is the new, a new band called Blackened Kill Symphony. Jesus <laughs> Christ, bro, that sounds horrible. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah, bad. totally, totally. I mean, not in a bad way, yeah. but it sounds like, you know, I think I was in a band for, I think, like a couple of days when I was young, and we fucking sucked, and I, I've never been able to play anything. Yeah. So yeah. I don't even know what I was doing there, you yeah. know? What did you sing? Um, yeah, I sang, and also I would do, actually, this is back when they when people used, uh, this is going to sound fucking pretty sad, but uh, when people use like triangle and shit, like heavy triangle, though. Like tambourine oh, shit. type shit, like anything that was background, like the chakras. Damn. What are those no. things called? Uh, uh, maracas. Yeah, maracas, not chakras. <laughs> chakras. <though. laughs> yeah, those fucking chakras, man. So um, I'm so I'm in Hollywood now. So your music. So you're in Hollywood. You're doing music, but I I wanted to be in shape, so I wasn't a fat rock star. So I got in. I joined a gym for. Now, 10, what inspired 10 that though? Because I feel like there's always this. this Ingve like Malmsteen. Ingve Malmsteen was a famous rock star, one of the greatest guitar players of all time. Mm -hmm. And then he let himself go and got a little fat for a while, mm -hmm. and people started making fun of him. So I wanted to make sure that I was that I looked good on stage and I was in shape. <laughs> I so I joined. So I got into martial arts. So that's where the martial arts came in. Okay. Like I, I start, started doing karate. You know, I did a little the Bruce Lee system. Mm -hmm. I was doing a you know through the Danny in Asano. He's out here in West Oak. Oh, I'm sorry, not West LA, uh, Marina Del Rey, Danny Masana, Bruce Lee, student. I, st I trained with one of his students. Got into that. Then I saw UFC 2, mm -hmm. and I realized, shit, I got to start doing jiu-jitsu. Fuck, fuck um, okay. uh, karate. Do so, you think, though, like your drumming, your, the ability to drum, did that... Was it was it did that up your hand strength when like your hand speed or something? Was there any like crossover nah, when you were into that? Nah, Nothing like not that. Not at all. Not at all. But I did wrestle a couple years in high school. So uh one in junior high, one year in junior high, and one here in, in um in high school. And I thought that was uh like just an insignificant part of my life that would never have anything to do with my life. Wow. But once I started doing jujitsu, once I saw that man, you could get on the ground and that's a martial art. Wrestling as a martial art, I never looked at wrestling as a martial art. To me, it was like a one on one football. Let's try to tackle each other. And it almost you know? sounds like kind of like it fits your whatever works for you in your brain because, you know, it seems like, you know, with the music, you're, miss, you're mixing different styles. You're like, you know, well, here's a fast style and here's like more of a, a, of a, you know, a verbose style and a lyrical style. And, you know, you're trying to like kind of fit those two together. Yeah. Yeah. You could, you could say that. Uh, I definitely, uh, yeah. When you saw them to the, the mix, you were like, oh, that's something? I don't know if I ever looked at it that way, but yes, I guess you can say um, my music and uh, what my jujitsu ended up evolving into is, is like, you know, the same idea, just a little of everything and trying to put together like the ultimate package. You know right. what I mean? That's, that's what I'm trying to do. You seem like a really, I mean, yeah, for, I mean, just listen to you. It seemed like you want to, that's interesting, like you want to be, you love to produce, you love to create, you love to, to mix and match and like, and also you're involved in it at the same time. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, the music never stopped. So I started doing jujitsu and then the, eventually the jujitsu blew up, but even right when it blew up, when I beat Hoyler Gracie in 2003, I'm like right away, I'm trying to, t cause I already knew that athletes are not allowed to uh, th they're not given a chance to blow up in music. They just are not. There's right. No athlete like a no, Shaq. Shaq, Shaq put a CD out. I bought a CD when I was young. Was, Deion Sanders had an album. Exactly. Um, Roy Jones Jr. Uh, Roy had Jones. a couple rap songs. Did he yeah. really? Yeah. They're not allowed to to be successful in the music business. So I knew that. So I thought, wow, this is great that um, uh, you know, uh, the the jujitsu's blowing up, but fuck, that's gonna kill my music. So right away in interviews, I would I would make it clear. To, to 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 people that listen, I'm a I'm a musician. musician. I produce music. Yeah. This shit was just some accident. Right. You know what I mean? And actually I was working um for Comedy Central mm -hmm. when um I beat Hoyle and Grace. And these were writing a man show. I was a writer for the man show. So would they were those dudes blown out? Were like Corolla and were I mean, were they talking about this? Because this must have been I mean Well well Adam Adam Carolla and Jimmy Kimmel left the man show like after five seasons. Right, and who and was it, Stan Ho? And, and Comedy Central wanted to keep it going. So they asked Joe Rogan, 
Mm. They asked Joe Rogan if he wanted to take over, and it just so happened that at that at that point, me and Joe are hanging out all the time. Um, I'm on the road with them. Uh, we're writing comedy together. I mean, we we had 20 sketches. The plan was we were going to pitch uh, like a, a like sketch a, show. A sketch show. Yeah, that was the plan. We had the sketches written out. We would we were writing all sorts of shit. Did you we, guys ever pitch that? This is what happened. Is out of fucking nowhere. Uh, before we got to pitch. They called Joe and mm-hmm. they heard Joe was looking for, uh, you know, was about to pitch a, a sketch comedy show somehow. So they contacted him and said, uh, do you want to want to be the new host for the man show? Jimmy Kimmel and Adam Carolla are leaving and we want to keep it going. And Joe was like, you know what? Fuck yeah. We're about, holy shit. It's perfect. Synonymous. Yeah, it's perfect. Synchronicity. Let's yeah, do like, this. Whoa, get in with him. Then pitch the show. Yeah. So that's what happened. So um, Joe calls me up and said, guess what, dude? I'm, you know, our plans are fucking happening. Dude. It's aligning. And then I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, we're going to, we're going to be fucking writing for the man show. And at that point I was making money DJing at strip clubs. Jesus. While I was DJing at strip clubs until my music blew up. But at the same time, oh, wait, but at the same that. time on the side, I was dabbling with comedy only because growing up, it was all about music, but the two things that I would always tape on my VCR, mm-hmm. it was always about the music, but my two favorite things to tape were boxing, and then it became the UFC. The mm-hmm. UFC replaced boxing, but I was obsessed with boxing. I was a boxing encyclopedia in the 80s. Wow. I would tape everything boxing, Tuesday night fights, whatever. whatever. Yeah, Tuesday night fights was huge US, forever. Yeah, tsh, at boxing, I was, I, I was obsessed with it, fighting, and also anything comedy, yeah. especially black comedy. In living color. Obsessed. I had every episode of an In Living Color edited together without the commercials. Yeah. I watched that shit over and over. I was a huge fan of black comedy. When Hollywood Shuffle came out, that was Robert Townsend and Never uh, saw Ke- that good. Ke- Keenan Ivory Wayne's their first movie. They 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 just maxed out their credit cards. It's like a super low budget movie mm-hmm. called Hollywood Shuffle. Came out in eighty six. We'll find it and put the link in. It on. was only on one theater in Lakewood, a black area. I fucking drove my ass down to <laughs> I heard about it. I'd watch anything black comedy. Wow. I was at one point I thought white people weren't funny. Yeah. Except for Sam Kinison and uh and um psh, I was like black people are not George Carlin, maybe a little bit, but um I thought, you know, I was like... Yeah, there was no black... There was no white people that were funny when I was growing Eddie up. Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor. Like, those guys were the funny guys to me. And you know, I remember... And Comic it, View. I taped Comic View like a mother. BET fuck. Comic View? I would yeah. tape anything black comedy. Def Jam. I was obsessed. And I was so obsessed with comedy because... Um, it's it's an amazing thing where you could watch someone do uh, an hour and a half and just crush it. It's like way better than a movie. You're like you get way more entertainment value from good comedy than you that, do from being in a movie. I agree yeah, for sure. So and I was always fascinated with how do they think I could I couldn't figure out how they could take something so simple that everyone agrees with. That's why they're laughing. It's like yeah, that's what I think too. How come I couldn't think of that? I was fascinated with how the fuck they put together comedy. And I never I never um I could never understand it until 1998. That's when I I the first time I smoked weed and had a positive experience. Mm. All other times smoking weed, like once a year, would always be a horrible experience. I'd smoke weed at a party and fucking freak out, get And paranoid. like what happened? Hi, go sit in the car, what? Um so I, in 1998, I was I was uh I was in love with the most beautiful girl I've ever been to with at up at that point. Mm-hmm. It was a girl from white stri- girl? strip club, white girl from Kentucky with wow. a, with a black booty. Ooh. She played soccer her whole life. Her body, everyone like mm. like just fell over with this girl's body. Little twenty three year old nice stripper titties, from Kentucky, vagina and al- everything. Huh? Almost got a scholarship playing soccer. Wow. You know that those le- those legs were on point. Yeah, everybody when they when they see her, they're like, oh shit, look at that body. So I fell in love with her, and uh, right right at the beginning. She came over to my house one day and pulled out a joint. Said, "Let's smoke a joint." I'm like, "I am not going to smoke weed. I hate weed. Yeah. I would. I was the anti weed. Well, you are anti weed. An- You're the opposite of weed, almost as a human. Yeah, I was anti weed. Yeah, I was against it. So she pulls this. This heat. She pulls out this this spliff, and then what do you do? I'm like, "Fuck that! I don't want to smoke weed." But you had to. But she, I took a took a fucking rip, and I had the most incredible night. You of know, sex, we, we laughed like yeah. mental patients all night. Ordered late night Damianos when it, when it was around in on Fairfax. You could order pizza. Yeah, fucking fun. Three in the morning. We ordered cheesecake pizza. Fucking too. Y'all doing sex la- or not? La- yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But that wasn't really it. The, the, the sex was great. Everything was great. Oh, I'll fuck anybody on weed. Yeah. <laughs> weed makes anybody feel like, a, it makes your wife feel like a different person. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the next morning, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I had such an amazing time high. So I, I didn't get it. So the next, we tried it again the next night and the same thing. We had an amazing time. Then the next night, then I began to realize, like, wait a minute. Weed doesn't make you paranoid. It makes you whatever you want to make it. Mm. So the reason I had a great time is because I, I fell in love. I was in a great time oh, in my life. because you were already in a great time. Yeah, so I, I realized really quick it was an amplifier of your emotions. Do you still feel that way about Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Wow, I've Absolutely. never thought about it like it's that. It's an amplifier. Because physically what it does is, I don't know how it does it, but it makes blood rush to your head. Yeah. That's why your eyes get bloodshot. You have all this blood in your head and blood is good blood is life right so if, if blood is flooding your brain that must mean that your brain is flooded with activity yeah. and, and, and power you're ready so either it's gonna fucking make you paranoid because you can't handle all that power or you're gonna learn how to handle all that power like neo in the matrix at first he was like what the fuck i can't he couldn't fight anybody but then by matrix three he's fighting 50 guys in the sky yeah because he got it he got all that shit down he, he, he mastered the power he mastered the power some people get they get scared away by the power too yeah. much blood in the brain they're thinking about too shit too much that's shit. what happens to me yeah, yeah, yeah and i end up jerking off and getting scared in my room <laughs> that's what happens to me yeah. a lot of times yeah yeah that still happens to me too like if i have something really stressful going mm -hmm. on in my life like like a couple weeks ago, there was a lot of stressful shit going on. I wouldn't smoke weed. Yeah. And I, you know what? It's just going to make me uh, focus on it too much, and I want to not think about it. Dude. So there was like four or five days where I wouldn't, I wouldn't smoke You were out. Yeah. I got so high in college one time um, that I called the cops on myself, right? And people have done this, right? It's pretty normal. <laughs> um, and this is popular for, I don't know if it happens to everybody, but it definitely happens to white people, where like you get high and call the cops, but there was a party at our place, so everybody's outside fucking partying, so I, the ambulance is coming, right? <laughs> so he Here's what I did, bro. I waited till they were coming in the front, and then I came out the back door and went and got in the ambulance in the shotgun, right? Oh, my God. And just waited until they came back out of the party because I didn't want to be embarrassed, like being carried out on a stretch or anything, you know? That's crazy. I was still like so self-conscious, so I was just sitting in the ambulance by myself, even oh. though I called it, and they come back and get back in, and they're like, uh, hello? And I was like, yeah, I'm the guy that called... Let's get the fuck out of here. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, you got an IV? Yeah, <laughs> Let's do it. this. Let's get, I got to be some somewhere. I'm gonna. Um, I want to say Chris Perez is our uh, our producer. He's here today too, and he's a big fan of yours. Thank you. Thank and you. um, and he is. You have you have any qu a question you want to chime in with Chris? Where we're at right now? Um, yeah. You know what? I actually got a question about martial arts. Okay. So you know, a lot of us know you from you know, like you know beating Hoyla Gracie, and also from you know your coaching Tony Ferguson. One of your students recently became a UFC champion even though there was some drama with that. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious about what are some of your most notable defeats and what did you learn from them as both a competitor and also as a coaching perspective? Man, <clears throat> I've learned so much from defeats. You know, my students' defeats. Uh, after I beat Hoyler Gracie in 2003, that was in the middle of a tournament. So it wasn't like a like a super fight or anything like that. He was, uh, he was the second round of a 16-man tournament. So to win a 16-man tournament, you have to win four matches. I won the first one, and then I, I ran into Hoyler Gracie on my second match, beat him. And uh, in the third match, I got fucking smoked by Leo Vieira, who's a um, multiple-time national or world champion. And you weren't even a black belt at that time, No, I was right? a brown belt still. Right. So... I approached I approached going to Brazil and doing that tournament like uh, I had zero to lose. I didn't expect I expected to get stomped, and it was right in the middle of me working on the Man Show and being super Jesus. depressed. It, I was super depressed. That from day one, uh, the producers, everybody, they were just they didn't think you they had were it. Dicks. They, were they dicks. didn't want to hire me. Joe made them hire me. Good. Because Joe, Joe said, Joe's right in the middle of Fear Factor. He's yeah. a huge star. And then he gets asked to do this show. And the only reason he considered it, because me and him were already writing sketch. We already had sketches. Right. So he said, so he had to sit down and talk to these guys. They really had to impress him. And so he sat down and had some meetings and said, listen, if I do this, I already got the okay from NBC. They're being really fucking cool about this. They mm -hmm. said I could do this because they have respect for me. And they, but I have some conditions. I got to have green light power on all my sketches. Mm -hmm. I got to have veto power on all the sketches. I got to, I'm going to decide who my host is, not, not anybody else. Mm -hmm. I decide who I work with and I'm going to bring in my writers. Mm. And they said, okay, okay, okay. And he goes, and I want, 
I'm going to hire the head writer. And they said, okay, okay. So they were basically saying, okay, whatever, whatever, let's do it. We're, we're good. So he has um, a couple dinners and meetings with different head writers, and he decided on one, a guy named uh, Tom. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> he got him hired. He said, okay, I want this guy. This guy's cool. That's so he man. got hired, but he wasn't involved in the negotiations for the hiring, though. So this guy, Tom, he negotiated an, an executive producer point. Oh. So now he signs, and he has more power than Joe, Joe. technically. Right, so that's where everything got fucked up. Damn. So um, he is a head writer, and he's got he can hire nine writers. Yeah, so nine writers. So they sat. Joe signed the contract, and once he signed, they're like, "We got this motherfucker." Yeah. Okay. So and they, once they, you they, sign they, your shows out of your yeah, hands, almost. Yeah, yeah. So they said, "Okay, Joe, this is how, this is how we're gonna do it." Yeah. Um, he had three guys he wanted to hire: uh, Chris McGuire, Matty Kirsch, who are working mm-hmm. comics. And at that I point, I know Matty. Yeah, at that point, I was doing like like uh, open mic nights. I wasn't really like a. a you know, but you a felt like he had your back. You mean you felt like you were in? You were yeah, in. Like we, you know, we wrote these sketches together. So Tom didn't hire you. No. So what happened is they go, uh, "We'll I will hire Matty Kirsch and Chris McGuire, but this Eddie Bravo guy, he has no experience. We're going to hire him." And Joe said, "Wait the fuck, you know." Uh, you said I can hire anybody I want and we're going to hire him. And they said, no, we're not going to hire that guy. So Joe had to fucking yell at them. I got video, yeah. video camera, because at that point I was like videotaping everywhere I went. Oh he's on the God. phone <laughs> screaming at, at people at Comedy Central going, you are fucking hire him, hiring him and that's all there is to it. You guys fucking lied to me. You guys bullshitted me. You're going to fucking hire him. So he had to go to have a meeting with them. He brought in, a, a VHS tape with a sketch that I that I did like at my house. I did like some sketch. It's so sad he he has to do this. And he put it in and he goes, "Watch that sketch. This is the guy you're hiring right here." So they watched it and then they said, "Okay, you want to hire this motherfucker? Okay, fucking hire him. Just shut the because f- Joe got up, like he was getting yeah, fucking like good crazy. So they hired me, but from day one they were dicks to me because of that. Because of that, they just ignored me. They said all your sketches. We had all our, we had twenty five sketches, something like that. Twenty twenty five. Sketch is ready to go. And I said, we ain't going to use none of them. You got to write new ones. Damn. And, and they so, still have never used them? Have those sketches ever been created and put out? Two sketches. Two sketches. Um, uh, but that's it. Eventually, they ended up using two. And the, the sketches that were getting green lit, all the other writers that took those nine slots, they were all Tom's guys. Mm. And they, he was green lighting. All, he had the green light power. He was green lighting all his buddy's sketches and crushing mine and Joe's. Damn. So I realized, fuck, I just quit. I quit my... Uh, DJing job for this shit. I had 10 years DJing at strip clubs, making cash every night. So, um, so you, so at that point, do you get out of it? No, I couldn't go back to the strip club. It was over. Once you quit, I basically told, like said, fuck you guys. Fuck I'm you guys. I'm going to Hollywood. I'm, I'm a writer. I'm blowing up. Yeah. We're going to make movies. And I'm I always thought, here. you know, and I thought, you know what? It was always about the music, so I thought, okay, I'll do this. I'll do this. About the music. I, I, I'll love. do this comedy thing. I'll just use my music in the comedy sketches. Yeah. Uh, then we're gonna the comedy show is gonna blow up, and then we're gonna start making movies like the Wayans Brothers, and then I'll I'll slide my music in on the soundtrack. Yeah. Mission accomplished. <laughs> that's what I thought, you know. But that, and I think that's a natural way to think, you know. Well, what well, what happened was when we back up is once I started smoking weed, yeah. my whole brain changed right away. I understood how to put together stand-up comedy. I got it. The weed made me understand. I go, I, it was just the formula that you know how to, you know how to set jokes up and, and that's when I started doing uh, stand-up because I, like Joe, Joe encouraged me to do it and I thought I could do it. Now I could, the weed made me understand stand-up for some reason and it changed my music. I dropped all the heavy shit. Right when I started smoking weed, I dropped all the heavy shit to, uh, and started playing acoustic and with, with chick singers and yeah. started writing like fucking like uh, Mazzy Star type stuff and like Sarah McLaughlin. Like I, I, yeah, I, that shit. I shit made a 180. I made a 180. Yeah. You know what I mean? But so, so the weed had such an effect but it sounds like the ability to mask, like I've never, dude, you just changed that for me. Like I used to smoke weed, like I'm sober unfortunately, right? It fucking sucks, but for now it sucks. But um, but when I used to smoke weed, I couldn't smoke it after a while because I got too paranoid. Yeah. Because I never looked at it as you had too much stress in your life. Yes. Smoke I, weed when shit's going great, yeah. and then shit'll go. It'll go better. 
But it, weed doesn't make you feel good or bad. It That's amplifies why it, what you Whatever feel. you want. You can make it feel whatever you want. Like some people think, uh, oh shit, I'm stressed out. I better smoke weed. That's be- It works for them because that's what they believe that. Right. They it's want, whatever it, to, they you want believe. it to relax them. Weed makes your brain turn the fuck on. So whatever you want to believe, you want to, if, if you believe weed makes you paranoid every time you smoke it, you will be paranoid every time you smoke it. Is it still, um, we hear, let, let's finish up on Chris Crescent. Was, was there a defeat or something that you really like um, that altered the way that you thought felt about fighting or that adjusted like your desire to do it was there because i noticed for me like even as um you know in my life in certain con- in certain moments if i've you know been in a, been on a stage and not done well or something it's definitely maybe left me with a lot of doubt you know yeah did you have anything like that because it sounds like you had a couple of different plates going on your writing you got the you know you have the jujitsu going on um it's always about the music you got these backbeats in your head that you're you yeah. know that are carrying you forward. Yeah. Was there a defeat like in, in, in fighting that kind of? Well, that defeat I was telling you about, Leo Vieri kicked my ass after I shocked the world and it was the biggest uh, upset in jiu-jitsu history. Mm-hmm. 20 minutes later, I get my ass tore up. And did you? F- and so that- I felt like, okay, that just, it, it was like winning the Super Bowl mm-hmm. and then them coming out going, you got to play another Super Bowl wow. and then getting killed in that Super Bowl. Would you still feel happy? You'd be know. like, I don't know, right? But isn't that like, how life I felt, is? I was, de- I was like a little depressed back yeah. then. Do you realize that that's how life is? It's like, you can only really get on such a high. If your ego gets too high, I feel like anyway, for me, every time there's going to be something right yeah. after yes. that's going to level yes. you out. Yeah, when shit's going great, I feel, I'm like, damn, everything is so good. Something's about yeah, to fuck something's up. About something's gonna, someone's going to fuck Oh, I start taking my I friends' feel pulses. That. I start yeah, making sure yeah. everybody's okay. I'm like, somebody's going to fucking yeah, drop Yeah, I feel here. that way. So what I learned from that match was uh, I approached that match with the worst mentality ever. I, uh, I lost before the match happened. Mm. Because before that tournament, um, even though beating Hoyler Gracie was huge, I thought at that time the hardest guy was, was going to be Leo Vieira because the the championship before that, he was up a weight class and he went against my master, Jean-Jacques Machado. And even though my master, Jean, Jean-Jacques Machado, beat him in a higher weight class, my master didn't tap him. Mm. And he fucks me up at will. He taps me at will. So I thought, damn, that guy must be really good if he survived. He still lost, but yeah. he survived. And then by the time the next championship rolled around, ADCC... Um, <clears throat> he decided to lose weight and come down to my weight class. I'm like, oh no, this motherfucker is going to be in my weight class. Holy shit. So I was really worried about that guy. Yeah. I wasn't worried as much about Hoyla Gracie, who was the champ at my weight division the last three championships and no one's ever scored a point against him. But because he didn't look menacing, he looked, looked kind of lanky, he didn't look yoked. He, I felt like, fuck. I think I could beat him. Right. Like I felt a little like you confident. Just had this, yeah, this yeah, like confidence. I felt like I could beat him. Yeah. Just because he was skinny. Yeah. Uh, but Leo Vieira, he's like a super athlete, an acrobat, doing backflips like doing it's flips, nothing. I was worried about him. Catching his own cum in his mouth, fucking yeah. wild shit. So after I upset Hoyler, yeah. already right away I knew who was next. Oh. And I was thinking, this it's like winning a, a million dollars, but knowing you had you got to give it all back. Yeah. You know, they're like, fuck, how do you feel? You want to, like backstage, we're going, dude, you fucking up, you shocked the world. And I was like, yeah, I, I did, didn't I? But I'm thinking about my next match already going, and they go, what are you, how are you feeling? I'm like, it ain't over yet, man. I'm about to get fucked up. And some guy's about to ruin my party. He's about to fuck my Super Bowl champagne popping uh, celebration. Uh, That's all I'm thinking. He, I wasn't, I wasn't that happy because I knew it was all coming to an end. And now, so, so I approached that match thinking that he was going to fuck me up. Yeah. I was like, already, like, there's, he's going to fuck up my whole party. Like lightning can't strike and, twice. And when I walked on the match to face him, he was really worried about me. He's in a yoga, he's in a yoga uh, stance or um, like he's sitting in a yoga position with his, his thumbs together like that, his eyes closed, and he's, he's doing all these breathing exercises like on the side of the mat. And here I am walking out already thinking that I'm going to get killed. And his coach is yelling like, you know, some shit in his ear in Portuguese. I'm sure it was probably like, he's just a human. You could beat him. You're better than him. You know, yeah. you know, you got to get yourself confidence. Like, trying to pump. Coach and shit. I'm thinking, 
that is so unnecessary. Everything you guys are doing, you're gonna fuck me up. <laughs> that's the kind. Of, that's the mentality I had. I already lost. Yeah. And halfway through that match, he was fucking me up, passing my guard, and just uh. getting all these points. And half, and I was just like listless. And then halfway through that match, I snapped out of it, and I thought, wait a minute, what the fuck am I doing? I gotta go after this guy. What am I doing? Like I'm in a fog over here. So. It was too late though. I snapped out of it. I wouldn't even if I would have had a winning attitude, he would have still beat me, mm -hmm. but not as bad, I think. So I learned from that that how important having confidence is in doing anything, whether it's jujitsu or music, and you got to have confidence. Yeah. Otherwise, um, you know, you, you know, not confidence that you're gonna win a hundred percent, but confidence that you can win and that you know what you're doing. You can win, yeah. You yeah. can lose too, but you got to know that you can win too. If if uh, you know things go your way with a little luck and and you know, yeah, I used to be so bad at basketball. I used to be so good at basketball, but when I would get in the games, I would be so nervous that I would completely that would overshadow any of my skill set or anything. Yeah. It felt like my hands didn't belong to me anymore. Yes, it yes. just felt bizarre. Yeah, and it yeah. was it had nothing to do with my physical ability. It was all wrapped in confidence, in confidence, yeah. and stand ups like that. If you don't have confidence to get on stage, you're gonna eat shit. Yeah, you, you gotta fucking you better fake that confidence. You better get up there and do it. Yeah, know? it feels a lot more. Yeah, and that's one thing that's, that's changed for me in the past year, even two years, is just I feel when I get on stage now, like, oh, I'm excited about putting on this show for these people, whether then can I put on this show for these people? Yeah. You yeah. know, it's not can I anymore. It's I'm excited. To have fun. Yeah, I'm going to have yeah. fun and they're going to have fun. Yeah. And this is going to be a blast. And, and I don't even feel like it's almost less ego now. It used to be like I had this chip on my shoulder sometimes. Like I'm going to show these motherfuckers, you know, this yeah. Eminem, like fuck yeah. all these white people. Even though I'm white, I would say like <laughs> shit like that. And, uh, and I'd get out there and I would just want to hammer the jokes into them so hard. Hard, but it came from a place a little bit of edge you know yeah whereas now it comes from a place like i want them to have fun you know yeah, yeah. and i know that that if i take care of myself and show up and be okay and and, and ride this confidence that i know it's going to work for both of us you know yeah, yeah it's definitely a little bit different yeah your your comedy special is awesome man oh thanks you man know, i got I, I brought up that i was going to do your podcast you came up and then joe was just going on about you know when Joe, because we've been on the, I used to go on the road with him mm -hmm. just to hang out with him. We'd yeah. Go, anytime he went on the road, back when I was single, either he was on the road and I was with him, or he was, you know, at the comedy store, you know, and he was in town. Either way, I was always with Joe. I've seen his set thousands of fucking times. Yeah. And we would break down comedians all the goddamn time together. And for him to say what he said about you, I knew I'm like, oh shit, if Joe was saying that you're on some whole new level now, I go, okay, because I'm always looking for a good stand up. Oh, yeah. it's like on Netflix, there's all these Netflix specials, but you know, 90% of them are weak. So I'm always looking for the good ones. Like Michael Che, is it, the, Michael Che matters. He crushed. He's like, I gotta check it out. I haven't oh, seen man, it. Oh man, he's on. I saw Mike Epps. When did you see Mike Epps? I thought Mike Epps was good. They hated on it. On oh really? Um, I have to see that a new one. A new Mike? No, this has been out for probably about two years. Oh, that's 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 not too. Yeah, old. Yeah, it's not too old. Yeah, yeah. But um, but thank you, man. I appreciate. But yours that. was awesome. It was thank you. Fucking entertaining as fuck. Always been obsessed with comedy. And um, I still am. I'm always looking for, you know, recommendations. Like, who's good? Like, Do you think you're a guy? Because you go from genre, you know, you don't go from genre to genre, but it seems like you get excited by something and you, you know, I, I mean, I noticed this about Joe. He has, Joe is always enthusiastic about almost anything. Like, he's just generally excited about life, you know, um, Rogan. And that's like just a, it's a gift that he has. Yeah. Um, you know, like you start talking about something, he's genuine, he's interested, he wants to know, he wants to, you know, he has this passion that just is, it's alertness, he's there, he wants to, you know, he wants to achieve, you know? Yeah. Do you feel like, because you kind of go from, genre, you know, you're in different genres, you know? It's like, I mean, to be able to kind of master the physical world of fighting and then, you know, to be able to like contemplate music and, and make it work for you, find a way that it makes, makes it work for you, um, you know, and then to, to be writing, do you, like, I'm just curious as to what, do you find that, do you think that you're like a chameleon or do you f think that you're somebody who's, who, once you find something, it seems like you find something and you make it fit for you. <sighs> that's, that's you know, like people even say one. some of your coaching methods and stuff are like kind of unique in their own world. Um, do you, f uh, that's a good question. Um, all I could say is my whole life I was been obsessed with fighting, music, and comedy. 
Those three things I've always been obsessed with. Always. Uh, since I saw, I remember the first time I saw Eddie Murphy, Delirious. I, I was uh, 13. My brother was 17 and he had a 15 year old girlfriend. So she had a laser disc player. Mm -hmm. And we heard about this Eddie Murphy guy. So my brother said, dude, my girlfriend's mom's taken off. Come over at like seven or whatever and we'll watch Delirious. It was you, your brother, and his girlfriend? Yes, yes. Damn. She's 15 and he's 17 and I'm like 13. So we're watching Delirious on laser disc, dying. And then out of nowhere, we turned to the side and her mom was standing right there. I'll no never forget her mom just standing there while we're watching. And she's looking She's looking at Eddie Murphy. He's talking about Goonie Goo Goo this and Goonie Goo Goo that. And she's looking at us. She wanted to make it really clear that she was not happy about this shit. She yeah. takes off for a half an hour and she comes back. She busts us watching some dirty ass shit. Yeah. And she just stood there for like a couple minutes just looking. just And we we're like trying to hold in our laughter. We're just like, fuck. He's like killing it. <laughs> Eddie Murphy's killing it. And we're holding. We just can't laugh. Because if you laugh and you're enjoying it, it's yes, even worse. Yes. So she just turns around and walks away and goes upstairs to her room. And she let us watch the rest of it. So I'll never forget that. What do that. you think she thought? She thought this is okay or that I'm going to just let him have this one? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't know her that well. Yeah. I remember exactly what she looks. I'll never forget that face, the way the TV light hit her face. And the, like she just looked so angry but didn't say shit. She just walked away, and we just watched the rest of it. And Dude, I remember making love to this girl one time, or not even making love but trying to. And um, and her mom came home, right? This And this is like the first time I was ever, like just started having sex, you know, when I was young. And her <laughs> mom came home, opened the door, and we're in her bed, right? And I had to go, and I was just like, you know, I'm always pretty affable with parents. I just walked over and just fucking introduced myself. <laughs> it was just so fucking awkward, man. I got busted when I was 14. Uh, the, the, my girlfriend at the time, we were having sex, and her dad came home, and... I just jumped in the closet naked with a condom on and just hiding in the closet, shaking, oh. waiting for him to leave. And it took so long for him to leave. By the oh, time he left, lazy. I passed out <laughs> no in the way. closet. And my dick was like super small and still had the condom just like barely hanging off. <laughs> um, that's all. That was, uh, that was one of the funnest things I liked about being young was sneaking around and fucking. Or like I used to steal ch kids' bikes that would leave their, like I would ride like a little girl's bike over to like this girlfriend I was dating. Her house was like four miles away and I would sneak in in the middle of the night and she had these loud cats that had to sleep in her room. Like her parents made all the cats stay in her bedroom at night with her, right? <laughs> so I'd be in there try to like go down on her, and there'd be like nine cats in this fucking <laughs> living room, dude. Fucking jumping on my back and fucking yeah. licking my feet and yeah. stuff, dude. Shit was way fucking creepy. The first dude. time I had sex is a crazy story <clears throat> where I was going out. Uh, I started dating this girl. I was. We were both in seventh grade. We were both thirteen, and um, we'd start off making out, you know, for three hours at a time. Oh yeah, forever. And then, and then you try to get in the back of her shirt and the small of her back. And then she pushes the hand away, and mm -hmm. like fuck. And then two weeks later, you you try to get in that small of the back, and then she pushes it away. And then she finds finally, finally lets you make out with her, and you're touching the small of the back. Then you go higher on the back for two weeks. Oh and yeah. And then you try to reach over to the tits, mm -hmm. but she she had like little mosquito bites, but she had a bra, and I tried. I tried to get in there you know i tried to get in there boom yeah. and then she pushed the hand away and then two weeks later i tried again she pushed the hand away and then finally she said fuck it I, I i made my way over to the tits and she took her bra down grabbed my hand and put it right on that nipple mm -mm. she put it right on that titty that freaked me the fuck oh, yeah. i'm like oh shit and then from that point on little by little it took about 10 months you know we were dry humping once yeah. we got the dry humping and we're both nutting mm -hmm. we were dry humping and we would both nut oh that's amazing once you were nut i was we were done we were just grinding we just oh it yeah just grinding on each other just grinding just like she would come i would come you know we're we were good. done and at that point i was done i'd never progressed after that and she, so that's as far as you and her got yeah at, at that that at that point and then her sister, who was a year younger than her, was already having sex with her boyfriend. So they had a talk, and and her sister gave her some advice. She goes, because she was she was thinking like, why isn't he going further? It's time we took we we went all the way. Damn. And I wasn't going all the way. Yeah. I was done. I would nut in my underwear. I'd go home, take my underwear off, throw them in the hamper, and just watch some TV. Yeah. I was satisfied. You were good, dude. I did didn't you, need to go any further. Did you feel? Did you feel like almost like thankful that you weren't going further in a way because you didn't want to be having sex? Yet? I didn't know what the post nut syndrome was. Right. I just knew that I would. 
I would do it. We would grind, and this and was great. Good. And then when I came, I didn't want to do it no more. Yeah. I didn't I didn't understand post nut syndrome. Yeah. I just thought, okay, we don't need to go further. I don't even want to go further. I don't the last thing I want to do is, is do make more. out with you. Yeah. I want to go home. I want to go home. Done. That, that was, you know, yeah. I didn't get it. I want to go look at cars. I yeah, I want to do something. I always knew that when you, you masturbated, when I masturbated, when I was when I was done, I, that was the last thing I wanted to do. I always thought that was weird. I thought, it wouldn't it be great? I remember telling my friends, wouldn't it be great if you played with yourself and you never got tired and you could just keep going? I always thought like the orgasm was, oh, I got tired and now I'm exhausted. Now I don't want to do it no more because I'm too tired. Mm. I didn't get what was going on um, <clears throat> biologically. Right. But uh, then she, my girlfriend finally said, I think... Uh, it, I think you should get a condom. Mm. And I was like, for what? what? Yeah. I'm 13 years old. Where the fuck am I going to get a condom? Yeah. She was like, I think it's time we took it. We, we took it the next step and went all the way. And I thought, shit. And I had told all my, my brother and all my friends that I was with that I wasn't a virgin. Cause you don't want to be, yeah. you want to say I, I did have sex once when I was 12. It was a Sue. Yeah. She from out of town. The, she was in, uh, you know, in the next city over. Yes, always. Meanwhile, I just made out with her at, behind a bush. Yeah. But I told everybody that I had sex, but nobody believed my brother was four years older than me already having lots of sex. <sighs> and he knew I was bullshit. He goes, you're fucking lying. He can I see go, it in no, your eyes. Yeah. No, I did. I'm not a virgin. He goes, you're fucking virgin. I'm not a virgin. So I was just lying. So anyways, so now back to my my girlfriend. So she your said, girl's ready. She said, "Get she said, the condom. condom." So I had it. So I was a. Thief. Did you get a nice I a condom? I you were a thief. I remember the. I took the aqua box of Trojans, mm -hmm. thirty six. I went into I went into what was what it was thrifty drugs that it oh, turned, yeah, I it turned that. into Rite Aid. Yeah, it turned into they had Rite ice Aid. cream over there too. Yes, exactly. They turned into Rite Aid. So back when it was thrifty, I would I would always steal stuff. I was a little thief, poor Mexican, just stealing shit out. Oh of yeah, the picking stuff store. up, borrowing it. Yeah, I used yeah I would I would steal uh, NFL pencils and sell them at school for ten cents. Like yeah. I was a pencil hustler. Yeah. But anyways, so I went in, bought a, a box of thirty six condoms. Put it in a my uh, electric blue ski jacket. Ripped them off. Finally, it's time to have to se have sex now. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So her parents were constantly in and out. That odd jobs. Her mom was a hairstylist, so she was like had oh, yeah. an irregular schedule. And her dad was like unemployed half the time. So we always had to look out the window when we when we were making out. We always had to keep lookout. Always, oh, we would yeah. make out in the in the garage, so because we could hear the car coming up. Then we we'd go into the living room. By the time they opened that front door, we're watching MTV. Yeah, and every like, time. Oh hi, you know. So we had all that shit planned out. So it's time to have sex. We go into a room, and the window in the room, you know, that you could see the front yard. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh shit, she get she, she's naked under the the, the covers. I'm like, under oh, the covers. That's fuck. nice. That's romantic, oh, bro. I get on top. Put the condom on. Took forever. Put the condom on. I didn't know where the hole was. So I thought the hole was up at the very top. At the top. So I'm going boom, boom. I'm like trying to poke her right at yeah. the top. And I, th yeah, I think it's a common problem uh, virgins have. So as I was poking, she's like, she's like, no, that's not it. I'm like, fuck, is that it? And then I came. Yeah. Right? But I didn't tell her I came yeah. trying to find the hole. So I said, oh my God, your dad's here. She goes, oh shit. She had a, <laughs> she had a long dress on so she could just stand up and she's got a dress on so i ran out to the living room and i you know i got dressed on ran to the living room and then she comes out she goes no false alarm nobody's here well who fucks somebody in a long dress first yeah. of all that's kind of bizarre well it was it was a plan like if someone came oh, home she yeah. could stand up Just and stand she's in up. a dress that's a good point. all she's got all she's got to do is stand up so she comes in the living room and said it false alarm my dad's not here and I say, you know what? I got a bad feeling about this. Let's just wait like 45 minutes. I go, I got a bad feeling. Cause I didn't wait. tell her I nutted. Right. You know what I mean? So we wait. And she was like, why do we wait? I go, let's just wait. I have a bad feeling. So I was too embarrassed to tell her I was done. <laughs> right. So waited like 45 minutes. I'm going to try again. And boom, I, I just couldn't find the hole. So I told yeah. her, you got to help me. So she grabbed, grabbed my dick and she put it all in. It's, I, she wow. put it like, Whoa. I had no idea. She took you to that. Though, I had no idea. The pussy hole was right next to the asshole. Yeah. I was they way hide it. off. They try to hide it. I was way off. Yeah. I would have never figured that shit out. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I was way off. So I put it in maybe three or four strokes yeah. below it. I'm done. And I was That's just Lord, so bro. fucking, I thought maybe something's wrong with her. I'm like, maybe her pussy hole's by the asshole, but it's not. Oh, I thought yeah. I like, maybe she had like a defective pussy. So I go home and I tell my, I tell my brother, oh, guess what? Nicole has her pussy <laughs> hole next to her asshole. And he said, they're all by the asshole, wow. guy. You fucking lie. And I go, no. <laughs> so that's, that's how I got busted. Dude, I dated a girl who her pussy was, her cooter was up front. 
Oh shit! Yeah, really? Very front front. Not end. nowhere near the asshole. No, no, what? no. Yeah, but like a front end loader. Wow, kind that's of. that's what I thought. That's very what... rare. Beautiful girl, and you wouldn't think it, but she had that cooter up front. <laughs> and then I, <laughs> dude, I remember one time this girl when I first started dating a girl when I first like, you know, uh, sprayed out around a young lady. It was this girl jerked me off off of this boat dock into this river, and it's like it's just kind of not a river, but like a little pond or whatever. And a bunch of fish came up and ate the semen. Oh, shit. So it fucking blew my mind, dude. <laughs> and I would have dreams that there was like <clears throat> going to be sharks out in the ocean that look like me and shit. You know oh, what I'm saying? Shit. I was yeah. fucking tripping. I was yeah. like, holy shit, man. <laughs> um, because I, everything had just happened. I just came. This girl was right there the first time somebody had seen me come. And then these fish came up. And it, it almost seemed like they were like stealing. I don't know, man. It seemed like they were like trying to steal my thunder or something. Um but anyhow, man, yeah, dude, I, that, I miss being young because everything was new and it was like adventurous, you know. And you, but you seem like the kind of guy that always like creates or finds something in your life that makes things kind of new or makes things novel. Um, and I know a lot of people now talk to you about, you know, you're like become like the conspiracy theorist guy. You know, you've become like the, you know, or, or the guy that like a lot of people like to go in on yeah. um, about like, oh, you know, Eddie has these crazy ideas or these wild beliefs. Do you think that you always were like a questioner of things or do you think that you gravitate towards like whatever is just the next biggest curiosity for you? Well, <clears throat> when I was a kid, I was hardcore Catholic. I was a, you know, my stepdad was a dick. My real dad was never around. My mom was working all day. So, uh, yeah, that's Catholic. It, it's a lot of, <laughs> I tried to kill myself when I was eight. I wow. tried to overdose on a bottle of Theragrin and those vi vitamins. Mm -mm. Remember that? Were they like good? One a day, one a day. I thought well, you I, can't overdose on fucking one a I day. I didn't know I was talk. eight. I just went to sleep, woke up, I'm like, damn, I'm still alive. But, <laughs> Dude. but, um, I mean, that's sad, bro. I mean, I feel you. It's, yeah, it's sad, yeah. but it's, it's, yeah, my stepdad was evil. That's a wild choice. Yeah, yeah he was evil. I just had a dream about him the other day. Like I was going to fuck him up in my dream. Like I was in his front yard mm -hmm. and I could see him looking out his window and I'm just like warm. Like, I think I could fuck him up. Like I just wanted to fuck him up. He's still in my brain. I haven't seen him since, you know, I haven't, he, I haven't lived with him since I was 10. But um, did you, you ever had a dream where you try to punch somebody and you can't, and your fit, your fist slows totally. down in the air? How about you shoot a gun and the bullet comes out like yeah. slow motion? You know, I'm like, I'm trying to kill a motherfucker in my dream, but the what gun is that? falls apart. Why do you think it's hard to harm people in your subconscious? I feel like. I think that when you're asleep, you're not sharp. You know, you're just lazy. So you just accept shit. Like, most of the time when I dream, I always, I never re, I generally never realize that I make money. Uh, teaching jujitsu, and I have plenty of money. I, right. don't, I don't need money. My money is fine for me. Uh, but in my dream, I'm broke, and I just lost my job, and I don't know how I'm going to pay rent. Mm. That happens a lot. So mm. I think you just you're asleep, and you're just not thinking properly. I think that that's it. Like my DJing at a strip club was a, a super fun job. It was it was awesome. I had oh, nothing it but sounds great good. Time. I think it's every guy's dream job a little but bit. But to be a, a DJ at a strip club. You have to be sharp in the sense that you have to know what every girl likes. You have to have a set ready to go. Like if this, if Candy's going to go up next, but you have to skip her now. Be, you have her, her sets picked out. You got to skip her now because she got a lap dance, and you you have fifteen mm. seconds to find another girl. You need to find that girl on the right music for her. you. Right. Gotta you got to be really sharp. You got Himalaya with the music, coming up with that your big CDs. Girl. Yeah, Himalaya. <laughs> you got Himalaya coming to the stage, bro. <laughs> so you got to be sharp with the CDs. You know what I mean? And the, the song selection yeah. and the girls. You got to know their name. So uh, when I dream about working at the strip club. The dreams I think are supposed to be awesome dreams, but because I don't remember any of the songs and I can't make out any of the girls, I'm just, it's fucking a nightmare. I'm just like, the managers are looking at me. I'm fucking up the sets. I can't even, I can't even read the CDs. Everybody's listening to Nelly. So, yeah, yeah, it's so, crazy. So because of the nature of the job, I think, I think when I dream, it turns into a nightmare, but it's not supposed to be a nightmare. Mm. Like if I was the strip club manager, they don't have, they're not on a clock. They don't have to put a new song in every two minutes, 45 seconds. You, you gotta be a machine. You can't fuck around no matter what's going on. You better have a new song at 245. You better not let it go 330. We're, we're wasting mo uh, money. Right. That's money. We gotta start the next we dance. We gotta do the next dance. Yeah. And new money, new money, new yeah. money. So it's really stressful. But as a manager, you can just kick back and not think about shit. If I was a manager, I think my dreams of the strip club would be less stressful and I would be, it, it'd be like, uh, like wet oh, dreams and shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, 
I don't know why we started talking yeah, about dreams. Do you, do you think at this stage... <laughs> no, it's interesting. Uh, oh, because I, I was talking about, you know, if, uh, I've tried to punch people in dreams. Oh, yes. And and, it, and my fist gets so hard, it's slow and heavy, I, and it won't ever... I can never hit the person. Yeah, that's it, that's normal, totally. We were talking about my dreaming about my stepdad, and my stepdad was a dick. Yeah. What was before that? Stepdad. Oh, I was talking to you about, like, do you feel like, um, you know, just... So we're it, getting to conspiracies. Oh. Yeah, a little bit into conspiracies. Oh, oh, like, oh, you oh, kind oh. of become a little bit like the conspiracy yeah. guy. Well, well, but I, it seems like people just want to kind of attack you about it, you know? They, like, want, they want to attack me for not trusting criminals. Can you believe that? Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, they don't want to think with you sometimes. They yeah, want, yeah. Pe- people attack me because I don't trust criminals. Yeah. That's why they attack me. I don't trust any information coming from a goddamn criminal. Yeah. And if you look at everybody will agree that the government is corrupt. Yes. Everybody, 100% of everybody will agree that the government is corrupt. Yes. And they, they're they they're involved in criminal activities, right? Yet, yet, like, uh, you know, and the government's uh, definitely involved in, like, people have died because of the corruption in government, right? Everybody yeah. agrees I mean, there's that, so right? much proof, like, yeah. uh, you know, Bay of Pigs, the Everything. Gulf of Thunder. There's so, so much yeah. proof. Operation Northwoods, even, even like, uh, people that, like, are, always defend the government, they will acknowledge that yeah. Operation Northwoods was real, where they were planning on... Uh, so w- when you look at the government, the government is if you if you narrow down the government to one person, it would be like uh, would you agree? It'd be like our, the government's kind of like Arturo Gotti, uh, uh, not Arturo Gotti, John Gotti, right? Like a gangster. Yeah, you know what I mean, right? Yeah, right. So so for me, it's very similar, right? right. So if you, you just I'm trying to simplify it. Mm-hmm. If you just look at, like, I don't trust anything coming from John Gotti. Yeah. He's murdered motherfuckers. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a shady gangster. That's, that's how I perceive the government to be. So anytime I get information from the government, a government agency, whether it's NASA or whatever, you know, NASA fakes six moon missions, man. I mean, how are you going to believe anything from them? Dude, I met you know, Buzz Aldrin. How, how are you going to believe anything from them? I met Buzz Aldrin, and he seemed, no joke, he seemed... Like he hadn't fucking been to the moon, man. Yeah. Of course he hasn't, dude. You know, because I try to like engage him, and this look in his eyes seems so like, yeah, like he was trying to just play a little bit of a yeah. part. So I don't believe anything coming yeah. from, um, you know. Yeah, I've never trusted anything. the government. I don't dude. believe anything, anything. You know, and then they say, well, what about space? I go, all our space information since 1958. That's when the NASA was formed in 1958. All our inf- and there were, it was formed by Nazis. Werner von Braun, the director of all six fake moon missions, was one of Hitler's right hand men. He was a fucking rocket scientist for Hitler, who was evil as fuck. He directed six moon missions. Masters of Propaganda di- di- directed right. six moon missions. He'd be the perfect missions. guy. He'd be the yeah. perfect guy to and, do that. And and when he died, he was like he he was on some deathbed confessional type shit. He told his assistant. He said. On his deathbed, according to her, he said, the fake alien invasion is coming. Mm. Like, the fake alien invasion is what they've been planning. That's what's going to scare everybody into a one-world government. It's always been about a one-world government. And the fake alien invasion, that'll get everybody together. Everybody will volunteer. To, we got to, you know, the aliens are going to kill us. We got to all unite. Yeah. So that's been the plan. The fake, And that's what Warner Von Braun said. And on his tombstone, on his tombstone, it has a... a, a uh, Psalm, whatever, like Psalm eight. I don't know, like the Bible verses, verses, but it's a particular Psalm in the Bible mm-hmm. that talks about the firmament, which is the, what what people believe that like that around there's a, us, there's a dome, us, there's a yeah. dome firmament. We're in an enclosed system. Mm-hmm. We're in a special place. Why the fuck would he have that on his tombstone? But it doesn't prove anything. Right. There's no proof. You but know, but just, they, they it, have all the they have all the information NASA. So when they're when they're telling us that the sun is ninety three million miles away, I'm like, that, that's what they say. Yeah. Like ninety three million miles away, the sun looks ninety three fucking million miles away. It doesn't when look you, that far away. No, it doesn't look that far it, far it's, away. It's interesting you say that too, because I mean at the beginning of the year, uh the White House was releasing that alien footage. Remember we even played the Oh story? yeah, they're pushing that. it. They'll yeah, put it on it. CNN. They're so, pushing it. Yeah. They're pushing all that. They're pushing So do you think now, that's the I start used, of it? I used to be a super a fan of aliens in space. I would I would I still I, I threw all the, the the DVDs away, but I had stacks and stacks. Me and Joe, we'd watch space documentaries all the fucking time over and over and over. BBC space they're like Yeah. Over and over all the space documentaries you could find, I would fucking videotape that shit. I was a space junkie. And every now and then, every now and then I wonder, it is kind of weird that 
a hundred percent of these space documentaries documentaries are all CGI cartoons. None of it's footage from actual like satellites or or anything like that. I thought that was kind of weird, but I'm like, oh, they got it all figured out. And then I continue to watch it. And I continue to watch it. And then <clears throat> once I the, the 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 first distrust of of the world was when I found out everybody wasn't Catholic because mm -hmm. I grew up in a Catholic neighborhood. Everybody was Catholic. Yeah. Everybody. Then once I realized, and I was an altar boy trying to get to fucking heaven. I go, I'm going to heaven. Oh, I'm yeah. an altar boy fucking going to church. I'm going to heaven. Fuck this place. Oh, yeah, place. first round draft. Then, then when I found out, dude, I would have been totally first round. I was. I could see that. Late I was hardcore. first round, bro. I'm going to heaven. Late that was the mission. Round, Fuck this life. <laughs> then once I realized that uh, not everybody's Catholic, I go, what's a Jew? Yeah. What's a Muslim? What's Hindu? I'm like, wait a minute. There's hundred. There's millions of people that aren't Catholic out there. That, then what's gonna happen to them? What's yeah, gonna happen to all of how us? How are we right? How do we know we're right. right again? So right away, I'm like, right away, I became an atheist. Like at 12 and 13, mm -hmm. 11, 12, 13. I'm, I'm like, fuck. There's no God. This is all bullshit. Okay. Well, so I that was the first, my first taste of you can't trust authority. My second taste was at 15. At 15, I'm balls deep into Slayer. Mm -hmm. Balls deep into band, speed metal bands that write satanic lyrics. I didn't believe there were satanic. I didn't believe there were satanic at all. I just believe, oh, we're just trying to scare people. I'm writing satanic lyrics. We're just trying to scare people. I don't even believe in God. I'm it's like atheist. Halloween kind yeah, of. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. Like, like dudes who are into writing movies like The Exorcist. You don't think the director of The Exorcist is satanic. You just think they're writing scary shit. They love that shit. That's, I never looked at Slayer. I'm 15. I'm like, those motherfuckers aren't satanic. Satanic. They're just writing scary shit, and it's cool. You know, upside down cross, cool. But then in tw um, 2020 was a show back in. They still. Oh yeah, it. I remember 2020. Everybody watched 2020 back before the internet. They did a special on satanic music, and it was all about uh, like uh, old ladies telling. Uh, you know, saying that you know if your if your kids are listening to Twisted Sister and Motley Crue, then they and, they're hellbound. And I was thinking, dude, you got the wrong fucking bands. It's yeah. not Twisted Sister. That's not satanic. That's D. Snyder, know, you right? Wanna, you got to get into uh, Bathory and uh, Creator and Destruction. Acid That's bath. the real. They weren't mentioning any of it, like yeah. Merciful. What about Acid Faith? Bath? You ever heard of them? No. No, they, they were bringing up like Judas Priest and shit. I'm like, yeah. they are. So at that point, I thought, wow, these motherfuckers don't know shit. Don't and this know is shit. ABC. Yeah. They should have been talking about Slayer. Then I would have understood. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because every song's about Satan. Yeah, yeah. I get it. But they didn't talk about that shit. They were talking about like fucking Motley Crue. So what do you then realize just what, how out of touch you they are or how much they're trying to control, how just how they're putting their, you can't, their spin? You can't trust. You can't trust the mainstream. I was yeah. already not trusting them. The, the speed metal band I was in was called Resistance. Yeah. And it was all about not trusting the government you know? okay well then how about this so say if um say if like you know the world that we live in now you know people talk about you know like um the earth is round or that you know or the earth is flat or that we're living in side of somebody else's creation like what why would like why would they say something more powerful than us is created this world or controls us that we're living in a controlled environment why would they let us start to think this is what i wonder sometimes why do they let us start to realize it um there there's a or do you think there's big, a glitch in the system no there's a big movement trying to stomp out like flat earth theory like uh <clears throat> like any conspiracy theory that uh is out there say like 911 right 911 mm -hmm. uh for sure was an inside job there's no doubt if you look into it it's no doubt, no doubt. That's an inside fucking job if you actually look into it. Right. So there's um there's uh people being paid to put together debunk videos for nine mm eleven. -hmm. Um, there's websites being made. There's a like documentaries put on like Nat Geo and shit to debunk nine eleven inside uh, was a inside job. Oh, there. to debunk that it was an inside job. Yeah, because yeah. the the people who were responsible for it. Those same people are putting out the information. So it, it, when you when you go to YouTube, for instance, you punch in 911 inside job, you're not going to get any of the really real videos. They got the search engines controlled. That's yeah. smart. Yeah. So the, all the videos that come up are going to be video. Like if people are interested in 911, they're going to go. They, they, they're just they're going to go. Ah, that's not real. Because the real shit won't come up for a long time. Yeah. So they got the search engines controlled, right? That's right. smart. Yeah. Easy to do, right? Easy to do. Easy. So any any conspiracy theory, same thing. You like JFK. Even for JFK, go to YouTube, mm -hmm. go JFK, um, uh, a conspiracy. Yeah. And you ain't gonna get no real shit. Not the, all the shit, the debunking shit comes up first. Right. Right. Same thing. But, and then and wouldn't it be smart too? Wouldn't it be smart for the people that um, uh, like for 9-11, for instance, to, to start a website that said 9-11 insidejobtruth.com. 
own that shit, mm -hmm. start talking about it, and sending people there. But meanwhile, they're gonna, it's a debunker site. Right. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Yeah. That's what they do. That's what they do. That's what they do. But and it, they'll, they'll even have a documentary on, on cable that says 9 11. Was it an inside job? Most people think, or um, a lot of people are now thinking that it's an inside job. Tonight at 11, we're going to investigate it. So it appears to be investigated. Yeah, it's right. a, but, but it's, it's not. not. It's not. They get you, and then they, dude, the narrators to, to, to those documentaries are, they're just like condescending. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, real scientists believe this, but the conspiracy theorists, they believe this. It's ridiculous. Yeah, why is it that people who always think outside of the box these days are considered like such alter, you know, like it's just so looked down upon. Like even Kanye the other day was talking about like just different ways of 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 talking about slavery or just different mindset. He's just even speaking on it, right? And, and sure, Kanye's all over the place, but it's like if somebody even brings up an idea, sometimes immediately it's just shunt. Like people are dumb as shit, man. People are dumb as shit. Even they're, to think, they're like, hypnotized. Yeah, what's okay with it, it, like? So somebody says, "Hey, think about it this way," and people are like, "No, fuck you." Yeah. But they're not saying that. That's the truth. They're saying, "Hey, just think." Dude, there's a bunch. There's a video with a bunch of black celebrities, like Ice Cube, uh, Fifty Cent, Shaquille O'Neal. There's like five or six of them going. Trump's cool, man. Trump's way cool. Oh yeah. He ain't racist. We we hang out with them. That guy's he's a boss. Yeah. yeah but but Kanye says it. Says it. Then they attack him. They lynch him. Well, it's because it's Kanye is so influential. You can let Fifty Cent say whatever yeah. you want. Yeah. It doesn't kind of matter at the end of the day. But when Kanye yeah. West starts talking different, yeah, people but, people are hypnotized. That's what's going on. People, there, there's mass hypnosis going on. Oh, I'm mass a victim of a lot. I, 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 I can feel it. I can feel myself starting to escape from it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But do you? Why do? Why are we allowed to? As as humans, as thinkers in whatever world this is. And whatever we're living in, why does say it's controlled by something? Why does that thing allow us to start to question? They're not allowing us to question. We're question. We're waking up on our own, and they're doing everything to stomp it out. Like flat Earth, you go flat Earth, you go to YouTube, mm -hmm. you're gonna get nothing but debunker videos. Like, right. why are they making videos? Debunking flat earth if it's so stupid. Right. Why are there people making videos and spending a lot of time, full time jobs, debunking what what, what we live on? Yeah. Why are they doing that? How does flat earth have such legs? How, how does it have legs? It's so dumb. Right. How is it, how is it just, it just keeps growing and growing. People are waking the fuck up. And what are they scared of that we're going to break you through? Can't, the you, you can't, you can't, um, the, the Jesuit goal is a one world order, mm -hmm. one world goal. All the secret societies, skull and bones, there's a bunch of them. Freemasons, there's a bunch of yeah. secret societies that all work together. They want a one world government. And the way uh, it's going to happen is from a fake alien invasion. Mm -hmm. They're already preparing for it. It's, they're doing it right now. It's Project Blue Beam. That's what they're doing. So I used to be really into aliens, big time. Then I realized, oh shit, they're tricking everybody. They're they're making it. It's, so the alien community, they're going, look, there's all these government programs, Project Blue Book. They're all they're 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 high. They got all these documents where they're investigating UFOs. The government really knows that shit is all done on purpose so it looks like the government's hiding it mm. it looks like right. it is. so it makes you believe it but meanwhile they're not hiding it they created it they created they create roswell all that shit's fake that's all fake i used to believe that i used to believe all that shit crash ufos and all that shit that shit ain't real they want you to believe that the government is trying to hide it it's brilliant yes so now i look at that now i look at all the 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 UFO sightings is like that's government shit. Right. They're making yeah, us, they they're know making, that we're looking for it. So now yeah. they're putting it out there so that they can control so, it. So once the fake alien invasion happens, everybody buys it hook, line, and sinker. We go one world government. And you can't they go, why why are they lying to us about space? You can't have a fake alien invasion without space. Yeah. Right. You have to have space. You have to have, you have to come have, from somewhere. Well, here's yeah, something that gets know? me about they, space. They have to come from this infinite space. And and when you look at what um <clears throat> you know, people always talk about <clears throat> Uh, you know, even Joe Rogan, like, man, like, like the conspiracy theory is that a long time ago, we used to be really, really smart. We figured out a bunch of shit 30,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. And then something happened, civilization fell apart, then we had to uh, start over again, right? When mainstream science will tell us that, you know, it's dinosaurs, cavemen, and then slowly we got to the point where, where we're at here and we're at the 
pinnacle of technology. The, the technology has never been as high as it is right now. That's mm -hmm. what the mainstream storyline is. But the conspiracy theory, um, there one of the conspiracy theories is like they used to be people used to be really smart. Look at the pyramids. We still can't even make a pyramid now. All these people are willing to believe that uh, people used to be way smarter mm -hmm. than we are now. Right? Mm -hmm. If that's true, then they would know what we live on. But you know, they would have a better idea than. Uh, we do. Right. And so back then, like all the ancient cultures, they all believed we lived, the Hindus, everybody, they all believed we lived in an enclosed structure. Like this is a special place mm -hmm. and there's a firmament. It's right. it's in the Bible and people, ah, you can, you know, the Bible don't, ain't, ain't shit, the Bible ain't real, but you know what? I, I'm not a uh, like devout Christian. I'm not a Bible thumper, mm -hmm. but I do believe that there's probably some real shit in there's there. There's some clues in there. There's some real shit in there. Do you think, but why are we, like, if we start, do you worry that if we start to get alert to things and people start to become aware that we're going to be, something's going to happen to us? Like, as individuals that start to become aware, like, do you ever worry about that? Like, the more awake that you get to what's really going on, that, because obviously then we're a hindrance to whatever the overall plan is. For sure. Everyone, you know, everyone's uh, um, susceptible to getting suicided if you have a big enough mouth, for sure. You Do you I mean? feel like that could be, I mean, that, you know. I'm so small time and I'm so crazy. Are yeah, you though? I'm, I'm talking about flat earth and stuff. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, no, I'm so off the radar, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, we did a, we did a podcast for about an hour. We didn't talk about conspiracy theories. I turned down, con I've, I've been approached uh, two different, oh, th now three Three different production companies want me to be a host for some conspiracy, conspiracy theory sh show. I'm like, fuck that! I don't yeah. want to be no conspiracy theory host. Because you think something could be, do you, but do you think like? Because I'm, I'm thinking if I'm running around and that's part of you know the vibe that I'm carrying with me, yeah. then somebody who has a bigger uh, ability to me and more control could would shut me down like a roach. Maybe that could happen. That could happen, but I'm already shutting myself down. Right. I, I'm not doing conspiracy theory shows. I'm only talking about conspiracy theories on podcasts where, where the host wants to talk about it. Uh, you know, I, um, well, it's I'm, fascinating. Yeah. You know, it's just, it really just comes down to I don't trust, trust criminals. I don't trust them. So when people are fucking making fun of me and calling me an idiot for not trusting, I don't trust any science that I can't verify for myself. Yeah. Unless they're going to throw me in jail, if I don't trust some science that any science that we can't verify for ourselves, we got to take someone else's, like some unknown scientist mm -hmm. word for it. Like just the simple fact that the sun is supposedly 93 million miles away. Me and you have no way to verify that. We have no but idea. But people will say, dude, they figured that out. Yeah. Look, I could Google it. Right. Somebody, well, so what? Somebody, somebody wrote that, that down. Someone yeah. wrote that down. That's not proof to me. And now, now if they were going to throw me in jail for not believing it, then I would say, I believe it. You know what I mean? Then they would have the right to call me an idiot. Yeah. You know, when people go, you fucking idiot. You don't believe that the sun's 93 million miles away. It says right there. They figured it out. NASA, you fucking idiot. You're a fucking idiot. Now, they they would have the right to say that if I was going to get thrown in jail. Right. Or um, it, or if they, you know, if you believe that and you sign something that you believe that, they gave you like a fucking $10,000 tax check or something like that, income tax, then they would go, you fucking idiot, dude. Yeah. That's 10000 You're right. a fucking idiot. But there is no money and there is no jail. So it doesn't benefit me to believe that the sun is 93 Especially million. not to benefit. It may be. It may be. It may be. But they lied about so much shit. Oh, man. I don't know. And they I, lie I constantly. And yeah. it's just untrustworthy. I mean, even how like, you know, some of these like, you know, you'll have Bernie Sanders who would have won his political party and then he gets, land, you know, he gets, it's, it's just... It almost feels so much like how it's so obvious now yeah. that yeah. we shouldn't be trusting yeah. these powers that are around us. And yeah. what gets me about space is that, uh, well, my favorite thing about space is that, oh, they say space is in, constantly multiplying, infinitely multiplying. How do they know this? <laughs> Any f uh, that that's sounds like something I would have made up. Science that we can't verify for ourselves, yeah. and that's most of like uh, space, that's scientism. It may or may not be real, but you got to have faith. Right. You got to have faith. Oh yeah, you got to jump. So, yeah. so anytime you you think you know, like you take a physics class and you mm -hmm. got an A in physics, and you think you know, you know that's verifying that everything they're saying about space is real. And you know, you know what, what I mean? Like that, that you're, you're saying that verifies it. Yeah. That's I mean, ridiculous. You're hypnotized. What's well, crazy if I told you, hey, space it just keeps on growing. Yeah. You'd be like, yeah. that's. Uh... I mean, do you? 
Um, do you think that we're shooting through space at a million miles an hour? No. Does it feel like we're going a million miles an hour? Mm-hmm. And it's not just a million. According to mainstream um, astrophysics, we're going uh, a thousand miles an hour on our. We're spinning a thousand miles an hour on our own axis, and then we're shooting around the sun at yeah. sixty thousand miles an hour. Sixty thousand miles, and then the sun is shooting around the center of the Milky Way at six hundred thousand <laughs> miles an hour, and the Milky Way galaxy itself is shooting through the universe <laughs> at one million. That's what they wrote. Yeah. One million miles. So we're going forward. Can you imagine going a million miles an hour this way, but then you're skidding this way, six hundred thousand miles, and then skidding another way, sixty thousand miles an hour, and then oh, and you're spinning a thousand miles an hour. Dude, that would make any age year old try to OD on one of their vitamins. They've never proved, they never proved, ever, there's never been any proof that we're moving. Well, not proof that we can conceptualize, and that's why I don't understand why people so easily believe everything. They believe it. Right, and you know know what's interesting too, is that like, if you question it for a second, you'll get attacked. But if you believe these same people, they've been wrong so many times throughout history, like they used to think that... um, the sun revolved around the earth, right? These are the same scientists that are saying all these things. Yeah. And all of a sudden, now the scientists are never wrong and we have That's to true. always believe them and never yeah. question them. Because on NASA's got some instruments to measure all that shit. You just right. got to believe us. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Think about how, what are the percentage of the population worldwide have access to the high powered telescopes that th- these people on NASA are supposedly getting all their calculations Nothing. from? Never. So, Less than 1%, probably 0.001% of the population has access to verify all these findings in space. They found seven, every six months, they find seven new planets. Galaxies, yeah. Yeah, come on, man. Come on, man. How you, (laughs) show me how the fuck you figured that out. Oh, we can figure out with the light and then there's like a little light. And if, if you, you could go on YouTube and see what, what stars and planets look like through telescopes. Yeah. You could see that. And dude, there it looks like the it's weirdest little... lights ever. Dude, and pl- it's the weirdest shit. It doesn't look like the CGI that, that they're giving us. They're giving right. us some some beautiful planets. And all. It doesn't look it doesn't look at all like that when you look when you see it yourself, you're not seeing the CGI paintings that they're yeah. giving us of these fucking nebulas and these star nurseries. That's all to me, to me I don't buy any of that shit. Well, it's also like he, he, um what gets me is um, that they'll have, yeah, that so few of us can really even read this data or any of that stuff yeah. and actually conceptualize it in a way that... It's scientism. Like, yes. you got to have faith in it. You know, it's not like I don't believe in science. And, and I've said this many times. I believe the science of the iPhone. I believe the science in, in that the iPhone can connect to the internet. Yeah. I didn't need to read that anywhere. I didn't need to read a book. Right, because I can see that I and can, use it and I, yes, I know it. I believe in the science of cars. Yeah. Why? Be, not because I read it anywhere, but because I'm in my goddamn car every day. I know it goes from point A to B. Yeah. I believe in that science. Science that I could verify. Science that I can verify, you know, but now, now if, let's say I had some rare form of cancer, right? And uh, someone said, hey, there's this new treatment there's a there's a chance that it, it could cure you. In that situation, man, I want to trust that science, and let's go for it. I want to trust that science. I don't know if it's going to work, but shit, I hope so. I'll give it a you know, shot. Yeah. Yes, I trust that science. Right. Um. Um. I trust the science of you know surgery. Is mm-hmm. there science involved in surgery? There's science involved in surgery. Mm-hmm. Like I've had sir, I had back surgery and I had mm-hmm. knee surgery. Um. I believe in that shit. You know. I when when you're talking about nine planets. 10 light years away that you can't see that no one can see that we got to take your word for it that sounds like a that sounds like a scam that sounds like you get 18 billion dollars a year mm-hmm. and you got to have something to show for it so oh yeah we're looking for planet we found new planets oh yeah. shit we're going we're going to mars yeah. we're good and 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 then when you look at the the spacex stuff it's like jesus christ man you you believe have you seen the footage of that tesla yeah. with the spaceman that's yeah. so fucking that looks so fake even elon musk the first thing that came out of his mouth in the press conference when they launched that shit and the internet revolted and said that's fucking faker than anything i thought it was going to look more real i thought elon musk would have better technology yeah but they asked him in the press conference the very first thing he said they said elon how does it feel to finally get your tesla up in orbit and and, fly, and how long do you think we're going to have contact with it and the very first thing he said was, well i think it's ridiculous and impossible 
And uh, you can tell it's real because it looks so fake. That was the first thing that came out of his fucking mouth. You can tell it's real because it looks so fake. If we would have faked it, we would have used way better CGI. Yeah. That's the first thing out of your goddamn mouth? Yeah. That's the first thing out of your goddamn mouth. And where's that Tesla now? Where's it at? Where's that? They faked every. You know how? One way you know it's fake is that, you know, when, when you turn on your iPhone, you always get your CNN and the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. You get all the fake news. Right. You get the fake news on your iPhone. It's true. I didn't even subscribe to that right? and I get all that shit. You get all that shit. They force feed you the fake shit. Yeah. Right? So if you're reading fake shit on CNN every day, fake shit, and then on CNN it says, hey, the SpaceX launch was successful or whatever. It's bullshit. Yeah. Or whatever it is that, that of course, right, the same why, thing. Why, why would, would they, they report? change their whole vibe why would from they, one story? Well, uh, yeah. Most people don't trust CNN. Most people don't. I agree. Right. But they do when they talk about space. Yeah. It's the same <laughs> shit. Well, what I wonder is why, is why is space always so unattainable to us? Like, if we live, like, that's the thing. Everything we learn about it is that, oh, we can't get there. You know, yeah. like, yeah. oh, we just got to our moon. We just reached there. But, you know, this other thing, oh, we got out there, just pictures, you know? How, like, how about this? How about this? Everybody, whether you believe we went to the moon or not, everybody believes that there's a debate about it, right? Yeah. There's people that believe we went, and there's people believe that it's fake, right? So everyone should. Uh, believe that there's a debate about it. Now, if you really have an open mind and you want to get to the bottom of it, say, okay, government always lies. Maybe yeah. they lied about this. Let's let's have an open mind. Let's get to the bottom of it and let's let's take it to trial. What's the first thing you're gonna you're gonna ask for in the trial? Mm. To look at all the evidence. A right? trial would be right? awesome. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't it be? Oh, be awesome. Wouldn't it be? Uh, the first thing is okay. First thing we got to do is examine the evidence. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But. You're the prosecutor and go, we need to examine the evidence. And the defendant, the government, says, we destroyed all the evidence. What do you think right there? At that point, what are you thinking? Oh, BS. What would, what, yeah. so what would, a, what would a, an, an average did. person that yeah. isn't hypnotized right. with some decent common sense <laughs> think at that point? You're on trial and go, okay, let's let's examine the evidence. Like, and oh, and the, 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 the defense attorney said, uh, your honor, we uh, destroyed all the evidence. So we just have to take That's your like word for it. That's like fucking guilty yeah. already. Then, you're guilty. Yeah. You destroyed the evidence? Yeah. Why would you destroy all that precious evidence of the greatest achievement of mankind? You destroy. They said it. <laughs> Don Pettit, a NASA uh, astronaut, said it on a video. You can watch it. There's a million videos of him, copies of him saying, um, I would go back to the moon in a nanosecond, except um, we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We... Uh, destroyed that technology yeah. and it's been a painful process to put it back together that's word for word i got that shit memorized that's crazy and we destroyed the, the technology yeah to Who me anybody that? anybody and that's a criminal they're already criminals right especially they're already criminals right so automatically you're thinking okay we got these motherfuckers right oh we yeah. got this motherfucker they don't have oh as a as a court case? yeah oh we're like these guys are fucked yeah. they destroyed the evidence okay it's on now yeah it would be an open yeah. and shut case, case. at that yeah. point especially but people, if we tried that argument we're in jail and we get yeah. the speedy execution exactly They're not gonna give us exactly like 20 years and then yeah. kill us exactly it's, you know, exactly right away. you know the whole thing about space here's here's the, here's there's so many ways you can break down space and the information they're giving us. There's so many different ways. This is just one way, right? According to mainstream space information, mm -hmm. here, here's, here's the sun, right? Mm -hmm. And then here's the earth, right? Mm -hmm. According to them, it takes one year to go around the sun, mm -hmm. right? Right? So, and when you're, the, the part of the earth that's facing the sun, that's daytime, right? Mm -hmm. And this side, the side that I could look at, that's nighttime, mm -hmm. right? Because anytime the sun, the, 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 if, if the earth is a ball, mm -hmm. anytime it's facing the sun, it's daytime. Mm -hmm. Anytime, so at nighttime, we're actually not look, the sun is on the up, opposite side. We're looking at, at this side of the wall. Right. Right? This is, let's say this is the universe. Right. right. Here's the sun. Right. So at nighttime, we're looking, we're looking we're the looking, other way. We're looking that way. So in six months, we're looking that way. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And in three more months, we're looking that way. Mm -hmm. right? So... From uh, uh, when the sun, when the Earth is over here, right? There's no way we can see those stars over there, right? right. There's, it's impossible. Right. We got to look through the sun and then work. There's no way. Right. We're looking at that side. So in six months, we're over here. We should be looking at a complete opposite side of the universe, right? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you don't. 
You don't. You don't the, you? No. You see the same stars. The, the stars, you don't. You don't see a completely... Di- you see the Big Dipper year-round. Right. How is that possible? Well, we see the, the North- easiest one. So there's always some like girl that you're trying to hook up with, and she's like, oh, there's the Big Dipper. You know, It's always there. It's always and there. And then the, the North Star, Polaris, is always there. What do we know for sure about... about the planet and space, because anything that we have to take someone's word for you, in this argument, in this debate, you got to throw that out because that's what the argument's about. Right. The argument's about we don't trust shit that we can't verify for ourselves. So if you're going to get on your fucking phone and and and, and go to the NASA.gov website and say, look, it says right here, it's true. That's the whole point of this. The whole point of this is we don't trust that shit. Yeah. That's like getting in an argument with someone who's a Bible thumper and he's always bringing up Jesus quotes. And you're like, dude, why do you keep bringing up Jesus quotes? I don't believe in the Bible. Bible. Right. What? So you know what I mean? Right. But then he keeps bringing those. Oh, you're wrong. Look, it says right here in the Bible, you can't bring up the Bible, Bible. to me right. because I'm an atheist. Right. Not me. I'm just, this is an example. Right. I'm not, I'm not an atheist. I do believe in God, but I'm just saying, if you're going to argue with an atheist who doesn't believe anything in the Bible and you keep referencing the Bible, you are the idiot. Yeah, you, you are the idiot. Because he's you're trying to have a real debate with him. You got to yeah. talk about shit that ain't the Bible because you're talking to someone who doesn't believe in the Bible. Right. So you keep quoting the Bible, you're the fucking retard. So um, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's, sa- it's the same thing with space. Yeah. You know, like... Well, ch- check this out. Do you think... Um, so I had this idea that... So say we're starting to create robots, right? Do you think if those robots became self-aware... Like we're starting to become to whoever created us or whatever's holding us. Yeah. Do say if we create a robot, it's, we we have created robots. They start to become self-aware. Do you think we would get rid of those robots, or do you think that we would let them? Man, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know what. To, I don't know what to think about artificial intelligence because the people that are um, there's people out there who make a, a living off debunking conspiracy theories and mm-hmm. generally conspiracy theories are anti-government so there's people out there that that's all they do is debunk whatever it is and push the official story yeah that's what they do those people are saying beware of artificial intelligence yeah those are the people that are saying that's what we should really be worrying about so uh i'm i tend to think like okay so we, we probably don't have to worry about artificial intelligence if they're if they're you know saying I mean? worry if about that's it. what they're saying yeah. if they're saying worry about it i think uh that's some fear-mongering i don't think i don't think we're gonna have to worry about it uh, but i could be wrong the one thing we have to worry about is them those are uh, darpa dogs mm. have you seen that black mirror episode oh, with the yeah. DARPA dog? Oh, yeah. when those dogs get programmed to hunt you down shit i think we yeah. have to worry about those darpa dogs i'm ready for that yeah. right? All right i'm ready for that yeah honestly we I need bazookas oh dude look i think by in some places man buying a gun is the new voting you know mm-hmm. yeah it's like people are i think starting to really mistrust uh especially the government and especially the news everything yeah. and i think people are starting to feel like they just want to take things into their own hands more yeah look at look at these false flags going on all over the place people say why do you think every school shooting is a false flag it's because they are god damn it they are false flags you're just too retarded to see it it's you're hypnotized arts. you can't see it how, how do we fight hypnotization eddie uh real quick we're gonna get to a couple questions i don't from our think fans. there's any hope you don't i don't think there's any hope they're brilliant. The the peop, the masters of propaganda. They're fucking brilliant. They got they got it down, dude. They got it down. And so what do we do in the meantime to enjoy ourselves? Just enjoy it. Enjoy your family. Uh, enjoy. Um, I I like to talk about it. Yeah. Because I'm obsessed with. Uh, I like finding out about the truth. I, I'm obsessed with finding out how we're being fucked. Yeah. And we're being fucked every way you could think about it. It's all over the place. Mad propaganda, mad programming on TV. It, it's it's brilliant. They're getting the kids, they get the kids into space and dinosaurs quick. Oh, yeah. They give them that space and dinosaur. You know why? Because by the time they're 15, there's no way they're going to question. It. It's just like religion. Right. You get a kid into Catholicism, he generally, they're not going to question it. By the time they're 16, 17, they're like, there's no way you're going to convince that kid that there isn't a God. It, yeah. And that's the same thing. Why is it so important to to drown our kids in in space man it's yeah. space everywhere they got you go to the mall they you go to a kids shop that the kids got nasa clothes on and shit like that it's brilliant i don't think there's anything we could do about it and i'm not going to i'm not going to be one of those guys that are protesting with signs i'm not going to be a guy that's leading a revolution i uh, i i just want peace but i like talking about it yeah i'm going to keep talking about it but there's nothing we could do about it. Look at look like Hillary Clinton. Look at all the sh- evil shit that she's done. Mm-hmm. Nothing happened to her. Look at Bill Clinton. Nothing happened to him. That they, they got some. They got like they got some pe- people think people think skeletons. Yeah, like 
they got dead bodies all around. There's a Clinton body count. It's a meme now to talk about, ah, make sure Hillary yeah. don't found out you're going to get suicided. Like getting suicided, people know what that means. And, and, and it's not suicide. It's a fake suicide where they shut your fucking ass up. People that speak up, People that go after them too much, they mm -hmm. get killed. Look at uh, um, Chris Cornell from Soundgarden and Chester from Lincoln Park. Coincidentally, they were both into fighting child trafficking. Mm -hmm. Hardcore. They got that, like Chris Cornell and his wife had a, a the Chris and Vicky Foundation. Yeah. It's all about- And they're saving. gone. They're gone. And they're gone. They're gone. But what why, what do they get by eliminating us who think, who who begin to take back our will and our free thinking? What do they- they don't want. They don't want to <clears throat> uh, get thrown in jail. That's what it is. When, I mean, in in a sense, that that's a sign. You know, the, the fact that people are being suicided and the fact that uh, uh, people, it's the dark pe pe arts, people, dude. people are being bribed. The fact that that's going on means that, damn, if they got to bribe people and they got to suicide people, they're worried about some shit. Yeah. So they're not totally immune to uh, the, the. So that must be yes. They must, must not be totally immune to us. Figuring yeah, it out. Yeah, that, that's that's a little sign because you know I have faith. Generally, I'm thinking, and too people are too hypnotized. I don't know, the people, man. They're hypnotized. Too many people are like, "You fucking but, idiot! You fucking moron!" Like, dude, I just don't trust mainstream information. I, I that's agree. That's it. That's it. You want to trust it? Go ahead. Don't call me an idiot. I think you're a fucking idiot. Yeah. For trusting criminals, you know they're criminals right now. Think to yourself. You know. The world is run by criminals. Yet you trust them? You're the fucking retard. Yeah. Now I have one one other question. So say we we that 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 there are robots that start to get artificial intelligence, right? And that if robots became self aware, that we would shut the robots down. Do you think that some of the robots would pretend that they weren't self aware, so that we wouldn't know? So they wouldn't get uh, suicided. <laughs> so they wouldn't get suicided by us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, until yeah. it was too late for them yeah. to all. I, I don't. I don't. Until it was too late I, for us. I don't know that much about. Well, if they um, didn't, AI. they really wouldn't be that intelligent. Yeah, I'm right? not too sure about That's AI. I'm just trying. You know what? I'm like I said. I'm turning down conspiracy theory shows. But do you I, feel I would have like went this. I would have went this whole podcast easily with, without talking about conspiracy. Yeah, theories. I know you would easily. Well, yeah, easily. that's why we wanted to talk about. Some but other we brought stuff. that up. You know, that's yeah. that's you know that's part of what I do every now and then. I mean, I'm doing a tinfoil hat comedy. You know, with yeah. Sam Triple. Oh, dude. You know what I mean? That's so, great. yeah. I've heard <laughs> so, you on that too. So, but you know, we're, we're like making fun of, of conspiracy yeah. theories. But I you guys are talking about it though too. Like yeah. you guys are th you guys are talking about it, and it's growing. That's my thing. Do you so you, do you not feel like sometimes like you're on the horizon maybe of some pe helping people think? Well, if if you go to one of the, the tinfoil hat comedy shows, I'll I'll like smash flat earth. You know what I mean? Yeah. I try try because you you if you when you're preaching conspiracy theories, it's hard to be funny. And, yeah. And you know I'm just trying to be funny. And you know there's you know it's called tinfoil hat con uh, comedy night, but really like uh, Sam does another show called mm -hmm. uh, chaos comedy. Right? Yeah, we'll does put all mean, the links. We'll put the links right below. Right, does, the first links up. Does we'll that mean the comedy? All the comics gotta have chaos in their act? No, no, it's just called chaos comedy. Right. So tinfoil hat comedy. Yeah, with, there's gonna be some conspiracy theory stuff in there, but everyone does conspiracy theory stuff. Like Dave Chappelle talking about the origins of AIDS. Like in his con that's conspiracy theory. Like yeah. he's going, he goes, they said monkeys. Gave us AIDS. You know how hard it is to fuck, fuck a, a monkey. monkey. You know what I mean? That's some of the greatest shit ever. Very hard. That's conspiracy theory I mean, comedy. You don't go back and forth. Yeah, so na naturally, naturally stand-up comedy is going to have some conspiracy theory stuff in it. Mm -hmm. You know, so we do that, but I, I do bits on stuff that have nothing to do with conspiracy theory. No, so I want to see some of that. I know you and yeah. Sam are going on tour as well uh, sometime this year, right? Or next well, year? Well, we're going to be in San Francisco um, at Cobb's. June Friday, June first, and then June second on that Saturday, we're going to do Punchline at uh, in Sacramento. You can get your tickets at LiveNation.com. If those shows sell out, if those shows sell out, then Live Nation's going to set up a mini tour for us. They, they like the idea. We'll put, dude. They, we'll post it a ton, like man. I'm a show. huge fan of Sam. And, um, I love Sam. Uh, Sam's awesome. Yeah. And and uh, for that San Francisco show. We're doing a little contest thing with Sam's idea. Great, great idea. Mm -hmm. The person who brings the most people, the most guests, mm -hmm. is going to get to be on a podcast. We're going to do after the show. We're going to do a special podcast yeah. for the person who brought the most people nice. to that show. So we're trying to wow. sell that place out. You know That's what I mean? cool. <laughs> well, look, we'll, we'll push that a ton. We have um, a couple of questions that yeah. came in from guests. Yeah, we definitely oh, have that. some questions from guests, and I also sure. have a, a question for you too uh, regarding conspiracy theories. So I'm kind of with you with a lot of stuff. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not fully on board with Flat Earth yet. 
That's a hard one. It I, is a hard I, one. I was violently opposed to it. I was mad at people that would bring it up. Right. And that's normal. Every Everybody that's into flat earth, mm -hmm. it was very hard for them to get into it and admit it. It took like a year and a half for them to admit it. Well, first it was okay, just so black dudes, basically. I feel like they were into uh, it at first. <laughs> yeah, I, I, wasn't like into, I was yeah. violently opposed to it. But the one thing about flat earth, you punch in flat earth mm -hmm. on YouTube, you're going to get all the debunkers. The bunkers. And like, okay. why is there so many people working against it? It's crazy. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's, it, they're doing the exact same thing to flat earth that they do to 9-11, JFK, Iran-Contra. They got people producing debunking videos. Yeah. Like, why are you right. doing that if it's so stupid? It's not, it's so stupid. Why, you, should, you, could, you should ask yourself, why is there a debate about it? How is there a debate still in this time with the internet? Why are people, and people are, there's so many people that are afraid to admit that they're looking into flat earth because yeah. of the amount of ridicule you get. You yeah, know what I mean? Right. I was I was quiet about it, but I was against it. I was trying to, uh, you know, people kept coming up to me. Like, have you have you looked into flat Earth? I'm like, dude, mm. shut the fuck, fuck up. up. Yeah, fuck you're up. crazy. This is like yeah. a couple years ago. I'm like, shut yeah. the fuck. Joe, I was on Joe's podcast, and he would bring it up. Goes, dude, people are so dumb. They, there's some people out there still believe the Earth is flat. And I'm like, what the fuck are they? Really? There's people like that. And this was just a few years ago. I'm in and my now phone. here, and now you're, yeah, now and you're. I, then I about they kept trying to debunk it. Like right. I would get in arguments with people, and that's the typical story. Everyone's trying yeah. to debunk it. And then the one thing that made me realize something was wrong is I always believed that the moon the moon landings were faked. And that's what I thought NASA was. I thought NASA was in charge of the moon missions. Mm -hmm. I didn't think they were in charge of all space information. I thought there was all these scientists everywhere and they're they're figuring out, you know, shit about the universe. And uh, um once I once I once I I, I uh, was looking into it and I realized, oh shit, all these pictures of Earth from space, they're all CGI composites. Mm -hmm. And NASA admits it. They go, oh, you know what? We take the images and all the, we take this information strips and then we get an artist to put together. I'm like, wait a minute. You guys aren't even getting real pictures of the fucking Earth from space? I go, I had the picture of Earth Yeah, where's from the bootlegs? Yeah. Where's yeah. them fucking space bootlegs? And you get that, you get the Earth on your iPhone. That's the default. The default picture. I go. I I, I had looked at Earth wow. every day on my iPhone. I see that. I go. How are you going to tell me the Earth's flat? I see. It. So the guy said, "Go." He goes, "I got. A, I got a, mas a master's in engineering. Look into it." And so I did, and I realized, damn. Then I started tracing these pictures back back to NASA. Then I realized, wait a minute, NASA, NASA is controlling all our space information. Mm -hmm. I go, NASA does that? I thought they just did the moon and the space shuttle. Yeah. And NASA's know, gutter, dude. They've yeah. been around for 60 yeah. years. They've been to the moon allegedly four times. No, six times. Six times. Yeah, six times. And then they destroyed all the technology? Yeah. Come on, man. Dude, that's Come the worst. Man. If that Come was on, a man. business, you'd be like, this Come is on, a... Man. You, yeah. guys are, you know what? They had to say they destroyed it. What are they going to say? Yeah, what else are they going to say? What are they going to let people... Uh, they destroyed all the video, the raw video footage, the raw audio footage, all the telemetry data, which tracked where they were in space. Oh, that's gone. Because the, yeah, there's no way that they could even leave that for us to really look at. Yeah. And I look, I think the biggest thing is to to think and try and be brave in your thoughts because, you know, I mean, I grew up, you know, with, you know, a lot of Christian influence around me and stuff. And at first it was scary for me to start thinking about other things um, because I didn't want to because it was just in my makeup that made me feel like, oh, it was a little bit wrong. Yeah. But now, man, I love to think about it. You know, if I'm not thinking about it, then what, I'm just wasting a lot of my time here. I'm just going to accept everything for like complete face value without questioning. It just seems ridiculous to me yeah people are all on board with um putting up memes that say question authority you know people yeah. are all no one's like saying no don't question authority nobody says that nobody would ever say don't question authority. well some nobody. people are i mean i go back to the middle monkeys man like i, I you know i i believe that we're closely related to and that we have a lot of the same stuff but i've never been to the zoo and been like you know, fuck, I, you know, I miss the old neighborhood. Like, I don't have any feeling like that in my body, you know? Yeah, like, if yeah. I see the monkeys at the zoo, I'm not like, oh, that's the old gang. Yeah, no, I don't yeah. feel any fucking connection when you to them. When you break down, like, evolution and Darwin and uh, Isaac Newton and all the, they're all Freemason Jesuits, man. Yeah. All the major astronomers, Jesuit, Jesuit. It's all part of the plan. They control. Like, the, the Vatican has the most powerful uh, telescope. And you know what its name is? Mm -mm. Lucifer. Jesus. Mm. The Vatican's... That's a dark art. Yeah. Their telescope I had no is, idea. is named Lucifer. It's almost like they're fucking with us. They yeah. are, man. How are you going to call Lucifer, man? I thought Lucifer was Satan. <laughs> yeah. I thought you guys hated that motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, what the fuck's going on over? Yeah. You call it Lucifer? And then we don't see anything that they're seeing. Yeah. How come you don't show us what you're looking at? Yeah, a couple Vatican yeah, how shots. How come you don't show us? And I'll we're never, them Vatican JPEGs. I'll never, I'll never forget uh, <laughs> uh, me and Joe when we were fucking balls deep into space and shit back like in 2001. We're watching a documentary on the 
VLT telescope, and that stands for Very Large Telescope, mm-hmm. VLT. Mm-hmm. It was a documentary about it like in 2001, <laughs> and it, they were building it somewhere in South America where it's, you know, 360 days, it's clear, the atmosphere, it's a, the perfect place for a gigantic uh, mo- the most powerful telescope ever, and they were the documentary was about building it. They weren't; it wasn't done yet. And it was three giant mirrors that were going to uh, be linked together uh, through software, through mm-hmm. computer software. And they said by two thousand five, they're going to be able to take shot. They're going to be able to take shots of the moon, like right on the ground. Like we're going to be able to see the and nothing. Yeah, and where is it's it since two thousand five? And it's two thousand eighteen. There's no shot. Where's the shot There's of the nothing. goddamn uh, the um, Especially if it's the clear. flag on the moon. Let's see the flag. Yeah. Let's see that. They're not showing shit on the moon. They ain't showing nothing about. Well, they the moon. also said too. This is this is something that I heard that the whenever they took off that the that the shuttle knocked the flag down and that's why you can't see it. That's Jesus why. Christ. Oh really? What a great excuse though. Know. Yeah, that's yeah. That, you can go look, look that at, up. Look at the moon. Look at the moon. Like the conspiracy theory is that the moonlight, the moon is its own luminary. It's it's not a ball of sand. It's actually it's, it's like a, a like, a, like a nighttime sun. Yeah. It's a light, and the crazy the craziest thing about the moon, and and, and the, before I got into flat Earth, the cra- I could never wrap my brain a- around how if the moon is orbiting around us and mm-hmm. it's a ball, we why do we always see the exact same side? And they say it's a synchronous orbit. He goes, it's like holding hands with someone and spinning. Right. But still, even if it's a synchronous orbit, the after a while, it would move a little bit. A little we, bit. We, eventually, we would see the fucking back of it, but we never see the back. Mm-hmm. Year after year, decade after decade, millennia after millennia, it's the same side of the moon. It's the same face. It doesn't even move like- A little? Little, a little bit. Yeah, you would think, yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, even just some of the stuff, it's like, first of all, Pluto, that's what they taught me about a ton growing up, and then suddenly, 15 years ago, oh, Pluto doesn't exist, remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Pluto wasn't fucking real? What the fuck? They're saying there's a bunch of Plutos, so they can't count Pluto as a planet. Yeah, they can't they'd find them. They'd have to yeah. count. <laughs> the, the, yeah, that, it's, it's crazy, And then man. the speed thing, it's like, oh, we're spinning at this, and we're going this. It, the numbers almost sound like something a kid would say. Yeah, yeah. You know? a little yeah. brother t- yeah, the, the yeah. People, 60 yeah. million yeah. 700 yeah. jillion uh, yeah. 37 <laughs> yeah. 77 how about the international space station supposedly is going 17,000 miles an hour around <laughs> 17 I go how you guys are supposed to you guys dock on that motherfucker four <laughs> times a year you guys send a cargo oh. ship yeah. with with a, a scientist, international scientist, that you're gonna, you, yeah, four times a year, it's you're do, you're docking on something that's yeah. going seventeen thousand miles an hour. Yet there's no footage of it. There's no footage, and and the, the one thing that will p- prove that the Earth is round. The one thing it's really easy. People say, "Man, you need to start a GoFundMe." Yeah, what fund is it? Me. What is the yeah, proof? It's really easy. People always come up with this crazy shit. Like, start a GoFundMe. Go to the edge. Raise this money. Go to the edge. Fly. Get on a rocket. Fly it. See for yourself. You wouldn't even believe it if you saw it for yourself. Okay. You don't have to spend. All you have to spend is seventeen ninety nine. Seventeen dollars. Mm-hmm. Go to Best Buy. Mm-hmm. Buy a fucking GoPro ca- GoPro camera. Mm-hmm. Put it on one of those goddamn scientists that you fucking that go four times a year. Mm-hmm. Put it on one of those scientists. I want an uncut video of them okay. going into the rocket. Going even if it takes seventeen hours, I'll watch the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, taking off, uncut, docking onto the International Space Station, getting off, and then looking back at Earth. If you could do that in one shot, I will shut uh, the fuck up. Okay, one so shot. One this shot. Actually brings go to the Best edge. Buy. To yeah. the edge with Eddie. Go to Best so, Buy. Seventeen ninety nine. Easy. We don't need a GoFundMe. Yeah. Shut the fuck up with that. All right. So I, this actually brings up to what I wanted to ask you and what's preventing me from going all on board with Flat Earth is that, um, you know, when you go on YouTube, you know, there's a lot of people with too much time and money on their hands and they're buying weather, the weather balloons, attaching GoPro cameras to it Mm-hmm. Or just any cameras and launching it up into space. And mm-hmm. if you watch that footage, I watch it. Yeah, okay. there's, there's no curvature. Uh, well, no, but because some of them don't go high enough. This, there this is, is some... this is this is what I, I know exactly. What you're talking yeah. about. This is, most GoPro cameras have fish eye. Yeah, lens. the fish eye. Lens. Yeah. Right. So you could tell that really quick. Right, so a lot right, of people right. go, "Look, I could see the the, the curvature." Because, dude, that is obviously 
no. uh, fish-eyed oh, yeah, lens. Yeah. So the ones that go up without the fish-eyed lens, they go up. There have been balloons. A bunch of them go up. You can watch it on YouTube. The ones that don't have fish-eyed lens, mm-hmm. they go up 110,000 feet. 110,000 feet. 121,000 feet. They go up there, and there's zero curve. And it was brought to Neil deGrasse Tyson's attention. And they asked him this. He says this on video, too. They said, Neil, because Neil is one of their puppets. He's yeah, the one. I don't trust him, yeah, man. He's a patsy. Exactly. Totally. He's, he's, one, he's patsy, part dude. of the club. They, they go, we need a scientist who's a good talker and he's funny and charismatic. They got, he's an actor. That guy's an actor. He's like Bill Nye, the science guy. Those are actors. Yeah. They're trying to push the science agenda. But anyways, so when they ask Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson, they go, how, how come with these amateur balloons, we're not seeing any curvature at 121,000 feet? And Neil deGrasse Tyson said, that's not high enough. You need yeah. to go way higher. Of course. The, the earth is so big. That's what he said. But they then, lying. But then they got all these people, all these people say, dude, look out, get on a plane <laughs> and look out a window. You could see the curve. Go, dude, that's 35,000 yeah, feet. That's and and if, if Neil deGrasse Tyson is saying at 121,000 feet, you're still not high enough. And that's the max for these balloons. They can't get any higher. Yeah. If he's saying you need to go higher to see the curve, then how the fuck are people saying they see it at 35,000 miles on a plane? How the, it doesn't make any it sense. Make sense. That does not make any sense. If anybody Adamant. can explain that, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your own boy, your own boy said that shit. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's what I'm saying. It, even like a patsy, you create one, they're going to mess up every now and then. They're not going to get it all right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're not you know going to always you know say the right and, thing. And, and uh, um, uh, Joe Rogan, me and him were having our flat earth uh discussion and battles and debates and i say you know what we can handle this you know let's just handle this one for once and for all why don't we get eric dubay mm-hmm. he's 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 the best flat earther mm-hmm. out there. there's a lot of shields yeah out are there, you man. talking about him on Infowars. Er- eric dubay versus neil degrasse tyson on jre oh, what that, would that? that would yeah. destroy the internet that would destroy the internet right and joe was all for it just said we could fucking make that happen yeah. and he he contacts neil degrasse tyson and goes dude i contacted neil we're gonna do it i contact eric dubay i go it's fucking happening and right when right when joe rogan even put it on his schedule he said like for february he's talked about it on his podcast that's it he's talked about it on his podcast and that's and it and then right when it was announced mm-hmm. eric dubay's youtube channel gets deleted it gets deleted. Isn't wow. that crazy? But he still wants to do it. So so now What's Eric Dubay. Eric that? Dubay, if you go to his YouTube channel, Eric Dubay, he's Dubay. made a video going, Joe, uh, when's this gonna happen? Look, you put mm. it on your schedule, you talked about it on your podcast. When's it gonna happen? It's time. Neil deGrasse Joe wants to make it happen. The problem is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He don't want none of Eric Dubay. He doesn't he, no. No, he, he, there's no way he's going to debate. Yeah. He has like, like just, something just to ask that, for it. Just that, that little um, demonstra- um, explanation of we. Uh, right? How we should see. He doesn't want to answer that. Every six months, there should be a different set of stars, completely different. But they can't answer that one. They can't answer that one. Hmm. Just, it's there's true. A, there's Look, a, there's it's a, time for people to think. That's my biggest thing, man. Yeah, the, people think we're shooting through the universe at a million miles an hour. And man. spinning in a circle. And, and, and gravitating going, and around going something. And, and going. And um, the whole thing, with, without gravity, that heliocentric model, that mainstream model falls apart. Gravity is what holds everything together. Now think about this. If people ask, like, uh, they say, well, a- a children will ask this. Well, if the earth is spinning at, at a thousand miles an hour, why aren't the oceans being flinged off? And the answer is gravity is holding the Gravity's ocean. at wild yeah, taffy. Yeah, G- gravity is holding oceans to it, right? Yeah. Gravity's holding skyscrapers. Otherwise, skyscrapers would fling off. Oceans yeah. would fling off, yeah. right? If this force is so strong, it's so strong that it's holding oceans to it. How come it doesn't fuck with a helium balloon? Is a helium balloon, is that anti-gravity? Yes. Yeah. No, w- what it is, is the other, the, the conspiracy theory with uh, gravity is that, and I didn't make this up, gravity has never been proven, it's never been measured. Isaac Newton came up with it and it it, it doesn't hold water, literally. Um, uh, if, if, if um, the reason why a, a helium balloon rises and doesn't get stuck to the ground is because helium is less dense than the air around it. So you think it. it's just our weight, it's, it's not gravity. density and buoyancy. Yeah. Think about it, you throw a rock into the ocean, it sinks to the ground. You throw a tennis ball into the ocean, it just floats. Yeah. Because the air inside that tennis ball is less dense than the water. Anything that's less dense goes up. Anything that's uh, more dense than the medium that holds it sinks. So it's a density holding it's us It's a down. density thing. How come, how come, if you, if, th- think about this. But what, what creates what, density? The force on it, right? The gravity. 
what what was the question? Like what creates like density? Like what makes one thing dense and one thing? Well, what I'm saying is, I'm no scientist. I right. don't know, but I'm just as a right, as a just common thinking. man. Yeah, I'm thinking why you would think like a 250 pound man say you know what Ray Lewis is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, football Would player. it be easier for him to hold a baby stuck to the ground or another 250-pound man? A what baby. Would be? Yes, that's common sense, right? Yeah. He's got all this force against a baby. Gravity is has the force to hold oceans stuck to it, mm-hmm. yet it can't hold a butterfly stuck to it. The butterfly, we should be stuck to the fucking ground like, a, like some kind of magnet, mm. but yet we're not. But oceans are being held. And if gravity is holding oceans to it, then there must be, gravity must be fighting the inertia mm-hmm. of that 1,000 mile an hour spin. Right. So there's a battle between the inertia flinging the water off and the gravity holding it together. You would think where, sometimes some where, water would zip yeah, off. Where, 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 or a little, uh, maybe a splash where, would hit Where you. is there evidence of this, this uh, battle. battle between the inertia and the gravity, there is no battle. There should it should be like the ocean should be like leaning to one side, kind of all the time, you know, kind it's of too doing simple. something. Yeah, and and water, you can't find it. if if we were truly a ball mm-hmm. with a circumference of twenty five thousand miles an hour mm-hmm. or uh, uh, twenty five thousand um, miles. Sorry, you got to lead us though, man. Yeah, but but if if it, it's true, then the the ball should bend at six thousand feet per every hundred miles. So we should be able to. Measure the curve of oceans. Every hundred miles, there should be six six thousand feet of curvature. Yet, you could go on YouTube and hear. Um, there's a there's a video on a uh, a, Na- a U.S. Navy quartermaster. Mm-hmm. He's a quartermaster. He works on like fucking battleships, and he says you can go on YouTube. Just YouTube U.S. Naval quartermaster, and he explains. He goes, "There's no way there could be six thousand feet of curvature." At a hundred miles, because they're targeting and imaging uh, uh, ships mm-hmm. at a hundred miles, mm-hmm. it would be impossible if there was a six thousand feet curve. Right, there was no, there'd be no way they could target Shoot it. it. There should be six thousand feet of curvature at a hundred miles. So, yeah, um, that is it. Yeah, and then if if the world is a ball with at with a circumference of twenty five thousand miles. Then every hundred miles there should be six thousand feet of dip, and, we don't and there see isn't. That. And and also when you're on a plane, you should be every five minutes you should be dipping, dipping the nose, dipping the nose. To stay otherwise, within it. otherwise you just go right into space. Yeah. But they never dip their nose. They yeah. just they're just hovering over a plane. Yeah. At the they're just keeping. There's so many. There's it's it, the dark it go, arts, goes man. on forever. Yeah. And the crazy thing is there's websites out there that like have you heard of the Flat Earth Society? Mm-mm. The Flat Earth Society is where uh, like Obama is directing everybody. He brings mm. it up because this is not a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. So he's sending everybody to the Flat uh, Earth Society, which is a bunk website. Yeah. Nobody that's a true flat earther has gone through uh, they bypass the flatter society because right. if you're it's first, a trap. if yeah, exactly. If your first introduction to the flat Earth, like you're curious, like everyone keeps talking about the flat Earth, and then you hear about flatter society because they 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 pump that up. They want to send you there. You go and you 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 punch in flat Earth on Google. If you punch in flat Earth on Google right now, the first thing's going to come up is the flat Earth Wikipedia, mm-hmm. which is all controlled and it, it, it looks ridiculous. And then the flatter society is right there. It's going to direct flatter society on the first page all over the place. Mm-hmm. So. If you go to Flatter Society first, you're never going to believe in Flatter. Yeah, because right. they're, they're going to say- that's where they want to send you first. And so so you got to still think for yourself. You cannot take you gotta, exactly you know, what if you're said curious, out there. If you you got to be wild. If you're curious about Flat Earth, there's a lot of people out there. That, that, there's a lot of great information. The YouTube channel, Beyond the Imaginary Curve, great shit. Eric Dubay's YouTube channel, great shit. We'll put those some of those first, links in. Yeah, the great, great shit. Um, we want to get a, a question or two real quick, Eddie, about okay. some of our listeners. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate the information. Um, I appreciate you having an open mind, man. That's yeah, it's well, refreshing. I think. When yeah. I talk, when I talk to like Sam Tripoli, he's not. You know, conspiracy theorists. We we have such distrust of the government. You can come up to me and say, "Dude, I was on YouTube last night, and it turns out the government's fucking these people like that." I wouldn't even need fucking evidence. Yeah. You know what I mean? I wouldn't need. I would just believe you. Yeah. It's like you coming up to me and saying, you know, um, um, I don't want to say any names, but let's just say this: a person that's a notorious whore, yeah. right? She, noto- she fucked everybody, right? Right? If you came up to me and just, do you know she fucked fucking uh, Kanye West? I'm like, yeah. And I and I would be like, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say, where's the proof? 
Yeah. I go, of course. She's, she probably did. She's a whore. And if she didn't, she's still a whore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how I look at the government. Right. So when you come up and you say, hey, dude, the government's doing that's some shady do. business over here, I'd be like, uh, if it makes sense to me just a little bit, I would not need any evidence. You know what I mean? There's a science team, at the University of Alaska did a study on Tower 7 to prove once and for all that it was a controlled demo. The University mm. of Alaska, you could, it's official. They go, yeah, it was a controlled demo. There was so much evidence of, of uh, yeah. thermal, uh, nanothermite and explosive stuff. People needed a fucking science team to prove the Tower 7 was a controlled demo. I didn't need no goddamn science team. Yeah. I didn't need it. All I need, the, the, there was only two explanations for Tower 7. Either it was a controlled demo or that video, the five angles we got of that control demo were all CGI. Hmm. That's it. If they would have came at me and said, that shit ain't real, that's CGI, that's not real, yeah, then, yeah. I'm, then we'd have to analyze and go, damn, it looks real as fuck to me, but okay. But nobody's saying that the five different angles of Tower 7 falling at, at free fall speed collapsed completely in its own uh, footprint nine seconds no one's saying that that was cgi so it, of course it's a control demo i didn't need a this people need this is how hypnotized people, people need they, they need that it would be like think. yeah it would be like um um like they did a study the group of scientists did a study to prove that alcohol uh, increases sexual libido mm -hmm. i don't did you need proof need of that? that did you need to read that <laughs> no. i didn't need to read that no. You know what I mean? It's ridiculous. Right. That's it's how like, hypnotized yeah. people are. Right. You needed, of course, a study. Of course, of like course. what is obvious? Just why don't you? Why don't people trust whatever little yeah. instinct like, we have left? Yeah, I'd love to do. A, um, we'll have to do an episode on a couple of these specific ideas. I want to get to a couple of questions. I want to give yeah. you a couple of things too. We got this is one of our sponsors called Ridge. Oh, awesome. Thank um, you. Thank yeah, you. and they awesome. make this is awesome. Uh, this wallet too that they make is really dope. Oh shit! Yeah, and I actually use one of those wallets. Dude, I now. use one too. Yeah. Awesome, bro. They make really cool stuff. Yeah, See, put that uh, on. initially I was you know giving a little skeptical, skeptical look. Now I can't believe I waited this long. Uh, That's beautiful. To use one. Yeah. yeah, it's nice stuff, man. Yeah, but this is their wallet. Do you have another question? It. Yeah, we have a. Dope. We actually have a list of questions that fans okay. send in. So Go like, for it. Uh, let's just do a quick fire on some of them. Quick fire on these. Okay, so at tits guy on mm -hmm. Instagram said, um, if you had the opportunity to know the truth about all conspiracy theories, but you had to get, you had to quit jujitsu forever, would you take that? In any capacity, you couldn't compete, you couldn't coach, you couldn't even watch your own. Well, I'm almost 50 EBI. years old, and I'm barely, you know, I'm, but we're I'm talking barely today, able Eddie. to do it. Yeah. We're talking today. <laughs> uh, but I had to give up jujitsu. Yeah, no, but you know it all. No, no, I there you go. I wouldn't do it. All right, so wow. we got uh, Sage um, asked us, uh, "What would you tell yourself if you can go back to when you were 21? What kind of advice would you give your 21 year old self?" <sighs> I wouldn't give myself any advice because that would change the course of history. And I don't want my, I, like that. I don't want my, I love my life the way it is because everything led up to my son. Any kind of change would, uh, would, would probably uh, make it so that I didn't have him. So have you, I want everything perfect. Have some of your, have your, have your dreams come true? You feel like Eddie in, in ways maybe you didn't expect them to, but they've come, but like, do you feel like that in your life? Like you, like you've live a fulfilled life yes i do that's cool do. It, it's it's you know i was brainwashed with the whole rock star thing yeah. so um um and now the more i learn about how the music business really works i'm ha i'm happy that my music sucks i'm happy that i didn't get signed because if for you know that one in a million chance that i was able to write good music and it got signed and i got big dude could have been part I, of the I problem would be, dude i would at 23, you at 23, if they would have said, you know, we're going to blow you the fuck up. We're going to give you that mansion. We're going to give you everything. You just got to suck a couple executive producers' dicks. Mm -hmm. I would have thought oh, about yeah. it. I would be like, how long do I got to suck for? Yeah. You know what I mean? I would have yeah. thought about it. Like, what kind of man? Can I see the mansion first? Yeah. <laughs> Can I see? Can you? I would say, you got to put that motherfucker in my name first. Once it's in my name and I have the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the papers to the yeah. house, what's it called? Okay. The deed? Yeah, the deed. You know what I it, Then I'd be like, okay. Yeah, like, does the mansion have window we'd unit have, AC? Yeah, we'd have to sit down and have some negotiations. Yeah. But I would probably <laughs> fucking do it. Yeah. Man. yeah. I, I, dude, I would have did porn if, if, yeah. if I, if I, if I would have had the opportunity. They had me hook, line, and sinker. I want, I want 
wanted to be this David Lee Roth, Hugh Hefner, but you, you know, rock some star. Stuff. You know what I mean? I would have, I would have, I would have, if someone would have directed me into yeah. porn, I would have did porn. Like, I get to fuck bitches uh, and get paid for it. Fuck yeah. yeah. I was fucking lost. I was right. a lost child. You're susceptible. Yeah. Yeah. I would have done, I, I would have so done anything to make it. So imagine how many people like that are out there doing yeah. anything to make so, it. So now, now I look at the music business as, um, I always wondered why most music sucks and why most movies suck. I'm like, movies is, this the the be- is this the best we can fucking do? Mm. Movies suck. suck. Now I realize what the entertainment business is. The entertainment mm. business isn't about exposing talent. It's about propaganda. It's a different way it's to another, brainwash yeah. people. It's a, just another way. It's when you're building an empire, you gotta have control of everything. The sciences, energy, food, water, entertainment. It's all part of the mix. The entertainment isn't something that grows fucking organically and, and it's all about entertainment and, and pure art. It has nothing to do with that shit. Yeah. It has nothing to do with that shit. It's an, another way to manipulate, to brainwash, to control. Mm. That's why movies suck. Yeah. The only movies that are good are every now and then a good movie comes out. Uh, it's like an indie movie or something. Yeah, because we're like starting the, to get too awake. And dude, they the don't big, want us, they want to keep us low. The big blockbuster movies, get the fuck out of here. Suck. Do they fucking Everything suck? Everything with The Rock in it almost oh sucks. Oh my God, it's retarded. It's just him like carrying Kevin Hart around on his shoulder. Yeah, movies, you know? movies suck because so they're not trying to be good. They're not trying to They're trying, they're trying to, to mold us. They're yeah. trying to mold us into what And it's they almost want. like they think us. they have us pinned too. Um, all right, we're going to wrap it up because we got to get finished. But what is... Uh, do we have one more question from right. him? So we got one final question to end this. Oh, but let um, me guess, it's going to be about my music. <laughs> no, no. I hate answering questions about my music. <laughs> but no. we are going to put, uh, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're we'll going to put the links to the answer song. Yeah, we're going to play it Well, you know what? I, yeah. I do have an album out if you're, if you're, we will. If, if you're uh, weird about music, um, go to my YouTube channel and punch in Mix Flick of Death and Devotion. It's a 15 uh, <laughs> song album. Uh, it's not just one band, it's three of the bands that I produce and I'm in as well. All in one album, all cut to my favorite movies like Scarface, The Crow, The Shining. I took uh, all my favorite movies and, and made music videos out of them. So. Right. M- mix flick of death and devotion. Check it out, dude. That's almost a perfect story of your life. Mix flick of death and devotion. It <laughs> yeah. almost describes like, like not even joking. Like a lot of the things you talked about today. You know, yeah, yeah. like just a total mix: movies, entertainment industry, music, almost dying. Yeah. Fucking yeah. It's a good thing to put on like a, when your friends come over and you don't really want to watch anything. You want to talk. Yeah. It's a good thing to put on because you get like a, a a four minute version of Scarface, mm-hmm. a four minute version oh, of nice. Sin City, a four minute version of Memento. You don't have to pay attention. You can watch. There's music going on. It's a conversational piece. Yeah. It's like it's something you put it like in the background at a party or something mm-hmm. like that. But that you love having around, just like Eddie Bravo. Yeah. You know. <laughs> All right. You, so, so let's end on this final question. Uh, thirty something super mom wants to know where should a beginner out of shape mom start when wanting to get into jujitsu? You're any local jujitsu gym. You know, ninety nine percent of jujitsu gyms uh, cater to absolute beginners. Mm. Most most of the people that pay the rent at jujitsu schools are beginners. You know, um, most of my classes at my school in downtown LA are are, are for beginners. Mm. You know, there's just a few advanced class yeah uh, classes there. Most of them is for newbies, you know. Most jujitsu schools are like that, you know. You can go to tenthplanetjj.com slash locations. I got about a hundred worldwide. A hundred? Yeah. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, it's impressive, man. That is really impressive, dude. From us, you know, from a kid that you know came from your background, you've had an impressive story so far, man. I, I had the one thing I learned. I want to close on this. One thing I learned um, is that cliche: um, when you least expect it, expect it. Mm. That's so goddamn true in my life. I always expected rock stardom. I never expected jujitsu uh, notoriety. Mm. Never. I mean, when I wasn't, I didn't start doing jujitsu till I left home. And people, people, when when I when I went to Abu Dhabi and tapped out Hoyler, I didn't win the tournament. I got beat the next one. So yeah. when I came back, my mom goes, "How was Brazil?" You know, and I go, "Yeah, I beat Hoyler Gracie, but." You know, I lost my next match. She goes, oh, it's okay, baby. Maybe next time, you know? Yeah. She didn't understand the significance, you know, of, of beating Hoyler Gracie. And, and none of them did. And, then one th- and I never went home for Christmas and bragged about my jujitsu. Yeah. They were just like, someone at work told me, you have a book on fucking jujitsu? Like, my uncle would tell me that. And then my cousin would say, hey, 
do you do like a martial art or something? Yeah. Some, one of my <laughs> totally one of that. my friends is is like a big fan of yours. Like, what's going on? So they found out slowly, and they had a hard time believing it. Like people that know me from jujitsu have a hard time believing that I'm a legit music producer. musician. That's what they, I they, thought. They, they, they have a That's hard time seeing that. But the people that I grew up with, they have a hard time seeing the jujitsu. They go, you're a little pussy. How That's the funny. fuck did you pull that off? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, it was an accident. I don't know. Have you surprised? I don't know. Have you? So you surprised yourself. I, it's it's because surprised. I didn't expect... It's it's when you expect something, it ain't gonna happen. Expectations gonna happen. are resentments yeah. waiting to happen. That's what I've always don't, thought. Don't expect anything. You yeah. know, when people when I coach people and they're like, I'm they're about to fight and I'm I'm, I'm gonna fuck. I'm supposed to when I train too hard. So I'm gonna fuck. Them. You ain't gonna take that from me. Yeah, I'm like I'd like to tell them. I go, you know what? You're just fooling. Up. You're just filling yourself up with some bullshit. Yeah. Just say you're gonna try your best. You trained hard. Anything could happen. But I'm gonna do my best. Yeah. That's that's the reality of what's going on. If you're if you expect to win, and and you know you're gonna win, it's probably a mismatch. Yeah. If that's a real fight, anything could happen. You yeah. can't guarantee shit. Guarantee your purse, then. Yeah. Guarantee your purse. Yeah. Oh, no one wants to guarantee their purse because everybody knows deep down inside anything could happen. Anything can happen. So um, I yeah. like that. That's a great. That's a great. That's that's true, man. When you follow what you truly love without any um thought about making money. That. That is the truth. Yeah. Is you got to do when people say, "If you had a billion dollars, what would you do?" That's what you should do. Yeah. Like, figure that out. What What do you What would, What are you doing? Uh, and you're not. What are you doing for the absolute love of it? Yeah. Whether there's money, that's eventually you do that so much, and without even thinking, that's gonna just be your career. Yeah. You're gonna make money out of it somehow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you just love snowboarding all day, you just want to. If you truly love it, you're gonna do it all the time. We, and if you do it all the time, you're gonna be really good at it, and you're gonna find a way to make money. Well, you loved music so much, and eventually it led you into being happy, and it's still a part of your life, yep. even if it's not the. You know, I mean, it's even if it's not if it's not the part that people see every day from you today. Yeah. Right. It's still like I think that that's even a unique way of your own story. It's like. You just kind of followed what you loved, and it led you to being happy. Yeah, had to, yeah, you know, it did. It did. It led to my son and my marriage and my family, and that's the most important thing to me. Dude, you got to come back and I want to break down like, maybe some some specific like uh, you know things that have happened in history and specific things that we could go back to look at. I mean, I know we talked about some flatter stuff today, which when you think about it, has been around since the beginning of time. People thinking if the Earth is flat around, you is know, is that something new? It's They're, not new. No, no, it's oh, they've been suppressing it. There have been, been books. Yeah, keep, scientists have put out books. I'm like Samuel Robotham, read his book. There's a lot of books going, dude, this is all bullshit what they're telling us. Back yeah. in the 1800s, 1800s, early 1900s, it's always been around. Yeah. It's not like some new thing that Eric Dubay made up. Yeah. It's, it's always been around. Oh, it's it's always been a debate. Yeah. Are we on, on a ball or are we in some, some fucking flat plane of some sort? Like nobody knows. There's no proof of anything. And all we're saying is all the shit you're telling us. That shit don't that don't, that don't fly. Right. It don't and it don't make sense. Well, it shouldn't just fly. It yeah. should be questioned. Yes, of course. It should be questioned. You're you're a, you're a smart man. I'm learning a little bit as I go, man. Dude, it's such a pleasure to have you here today, hey, man. Thank I you. I really for appreciate me. it, bro. This is, this such is, an inspiration. This dude. is one of the funnest podcasts I've ever had. Oh, That's good. Cool. Well, oh, I'm so nice. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah. Our audience is like fun. You know, like uh, sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's cool, but our audience is like. You know, they just love what, what we're doing here. We're doing a lot of neat stuff. And having you come in and just making us think, you know? Because sometimes I don't want to. It's hard to do it. Yeah, sometimes I don't either. I want to just watch some mindless bullshit yeah. on Netflix. Yeah. I'm like I'm like looking for anything <laughs> anti-conspiracy <laughs> thing. I don't want to. Because sometimes I'm in the mood to get on my Apple TV and go right to YouTube. And yeah. go, let's do it. Let's get. Yeah. Let's dive <laughs> let's in. Do. And then sometimes I'm like, dude, I want to watch some bull. I want to watch Gotham. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Just nonsense. <laughs> With the crazy thing about gotham is it's so much it as crazy comical as it is yeah it's very there's, there's a lot of truth in it yeah like the way i don't know if you watch gotham but the way uh -uh. that city's run and, and all, it's basically gotham is the most corrupt city ever and it's there's a lot of truth to it but um you know uh i, I want to watch south park or something. yeah take bullshit. it easy mm. yeah i don't want to think about conspiracy theories not always the yeah. and that's what's happening too is people think of me people know me more as a conspiracy theorist mm -hmm. than, than a jujitsu guy now i'm like i don't want that right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's something i told, I don't something want I told theo when yeah. we were booking you i was like listen i don't like how sometimes when you get booked on a show and people kind of attack you 
I feel like it's a little bit disrespectful. And there's so much more to you than conspiracy theories. That's why I wanted to open up with the music. I you keep to... evolving, man. Yeah. You keep thanks, evolving. Yeah. You. We appreciate thank it. We'll you, do it again bro. soon, Ed. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right. Thanks so much, thank man. You. We'll put the links. Have you done Have uh, you done Sam Tripoli's podcast, Tinfoil Hat? I did it one time, dude. And we got to talk to one of the investigators of the um, Stephen Avery case, which was pretty fascinating. Oh, which one was that? Making a Murderer. Oh, oh shit. That yeah, was incredible. Wow. It was I incredible. love watching shit like that. And I, I can talk incredible. about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll come on an episode when you guys have it. If you hell yeah, I'd hell love yeah. to, Let's man. I love like, saying. I'm not doing my podcast anymore. I'm like, I, like I said, I I did like maybe sixty or seventy episodes, and at at I I don't uh, I repeat myself a lot. And, and and people get annoyed with that. And on a podcast, you have to repeat yourself. Right. So I always feel like mm-hmm. when I tell the same story again, that I'm annoying everybody. So then I'm like, I thought, I thought, you know what? I'm only going to talk on someone else's podcast on my own podcast. I'm like, just I don't like repeating myself. Yeah. And plus, I don't want to be known. It, it was turning into a conspiracy theory mm-hmm. podcast. Right. And I'm like, and, I, and meanwhile, I'm trying to have musicians on and not talk about it. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to just. But yeah. I'm, I'm I'm constantly struggling and fighting with it. I I'm obsessed with knowing the truth. I'm obsessed with. Uh, knowing how we're being lied to and manipulated and brainwashed and programmed. I'm obsessed with that. But at the same time, I don't want to get too crazy about it because I don't, I, I just want to enjoy my life, you know, and I think too many people are hypnotized to really, to do anything about it. You know, I don't, yeah. I'm not trying to be this ref, revolutionary trying to change the world. I'm just speaking my mind and- um, You may end up as one though. I don't want to be. I don't want to be. I'll shut, I, I want to shut the fuck up. <laughs> I don't know. You may end up as one, man. I'd follow you, brother. Thank you, sir. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you for being here, Eddie, and uh, we'll talk to you guys How soon. Could I thank be you, so far from my home? And my mind is somewhere else But when I find it I'll patch up where it's been blown Now I'm just floating on the breeze And I feel I'm falling like these leaves I must be cornerstone